Biographical Sketch of James Russell Lowell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Biographical Sketch of James Russell Lowell by Nathan Haskell Dole. In the year 1639, Percival Lowell, or Lowell, a merchant of Bristol, England, landed at the little seaport town of Newbury, Massachusetts. We generally speak of a man's descent. In the case of James Russell Lowell's ancestry, it was rather an ascent through eight generations. Percival Lowell's son, John Lowell, was a worthy cooper in old Newbury. His great-grandson was a shoemaker. His great-great-grandson was the Reverend John Lowell of Newburyport, the father of the Honorable John Lowell, who was regarded as the author of the clause in the Massachusetts Constitution abolishing slavery. Judge Lowell's son, Charles, was a Unitarian minister, learned, saintly, and discreet. He married Miss Harriet Trail Spence of Portsmouth, a woman of superior mind, of great wit, vivacity, and an impetuosity that reached eccentricity. She was of Celtic blood, of a family that came from the Orkneys, and claimed descent from the Sir Patrick Spens of the grand old ballad. Several of her family were connected with the American Navy. Her father was Keith Spence, purser of the frigate Philadelphia, and a prisoner at Tripoli. By ancestry on both sides, and by connections with the Russells and other distinguished families, Lowell was a good type of the New England gentleman. He was born on the 22nd of February, 1819, at Elmwood, not far from Brattle Street, Cambridge. The three-storied colonial mansion of wood was built in 1767 by Thomas Oliver, the last royal lieutenant governor before the Revolution. Like other houses in Tory Row, it was abandoned by its owners. Soon afterwards it came into possession of Elbridge Gerry, governor of Massachusetts and fifth vice-president of the United States, whose memory and name are kept alive by the term gerrymander. It next became the property of Dr. Lowell about a year before the birth of his youngest child, and it was the home of the poet until his death. Lowell's early education was obtained mainly at a school kept nearly opposite Elmwood by a retired publisher, an Englishman, Mr. William Wells. He also studied in the classical school of Mr. Daniel G. Ingraham in Boston. He was graduated from Harvard College in the class of 1838, he is reported as declaring that he read almost everything except the class books prescribed by the faculty. Lowell says in one of his early poems referring to Harvard, Though lightly prized the ribboned parchments three, yet collegisa uat, I am glad that here what colleging was mine I had. He was secretary of the Hasty Pudding Society, and one of the editors of the college periodical, Harvardiana, to which he contributed various articles in prose and verse, his neglect of prescribed studies and disregard of college discipline resulted in his rustication just before commencement in 1838. He was sent to Concord, where he resided in the family of Barzillai Frost and made the acquaintance of Emerson, then beginning to rouse the ire of conservative Unitarianism by his transcendental philosophy. Of the brilliant but overestimated Margaret Fuller, who afterwards severely criticized Lowell's verse, and of other well-known residents of the pretty town. He had been elected poet of his class. His removal from college prevented him from delivering the poem, which was afterwards published anonymously for private distribution. It contained a satire on abolitionists and reformers. I know the village, he writes long afterwards in the person of Hosea Biglow, Esquire, I know the village, though, was sent there once a schoolin, cause to home I played the dunce. On his return to Cambridge, he took up the study of law, and in 1840 received the degree of LLB. He even went so far as to open an office in Boston, but it is a question whether there was any actual basis of fact in a whimsical sketch of his entitled My First Client, published in the short-lived Boston Miscellany, edited by Nathan Hale. Several things engrossed Lowell's attention to the exclusion of law. Society at Cambridge was particularly attractive at that time. Alston, the painter, was living at Cambridgeport. Judge Story's pleasant home was on Brattle Street. The Fays then occupied the house which has since become the seat of Radcliffe College. 
Longfellow, described as a slender, blonde, young professor, was established in the Craigie House. The famous names of Dr. Palfrey, Professor Andrews Norton, father of Lowell's friend and biographer, the saintly Henry Ware, and others will occur to the reader. He was fond of walking and knew every inch of the beautiful ground then called Sweet Auburn, now turned by the hand of misguided man into that most distressing of monstrosities, a modern cemetery. He haunted the poetic shades of the Waverley Oaks, heard the charming music of Beaver Brook, and climbed the hills of Belmont and Arlington. He himself took his turn in establishing a magazine. In January 1843, he started the Pioneer, to which Hawthorne, John Neal, Miss Barrett, Poe, Whittier, Story, Parsons, and others contributed, and which, in spite of such an array of talent, perished untimely during the winds of March. He had already published in 1841 a little volume of poems entitled A Year's Life. They were marked by no great originality, betrayed little promise of future eminence, and Margaret Fuller, who reviewed them, was quite right in asserting that neither the imagery nor the music of Lowell's verses was his own. The first sonnet in the present volume, page one, practically acknowledges the force of this criticism. The influence of Wordsworth and Tennyson may be distinctly traced in most of them, but many of the lines were harsh and many of the rhymes were careless. Lowell's later and corrector taste omitted most of them from his collected works. Not far from Elmwood, but in the adjoining village of Watertown, lived one of Lowell's classmates, whose sister, Maria White, a slender, delicate girl with a poetic genius in some respects more regulated and lofty than his own, early inspired him with a true and saving love. Speaking of the influences that molded his life, George William Curtis says, the first and most enduring was an early and happy passion for a lovely and high-minded woman who became his wife, the Egeria who exalted his youth and confirmed his noblest aspirations, a heaven-eyed counselor of the serener air who filled his mind with peace and his life with joy. The young lady's prudent father objected to the marriage until the newly-fledged lawyer should be in a position to support his wife. Shortly after the shipwreck of The Pioneer, Lowell was offered a hundred dollars by Graham's Monthly for ten poems. When Pegasus is able to earn such princely sums, there seems no reason why love should be kept waiting at the cottage door. In 1844, Lowell published a new edition of his poems and married Miss White. It was her influence that decided him to cast in his lot with the abolitionists. It was her refined taste that shaped and tempered his impetuous verse. A volume of her poems was in 1855 in an edition of fifty copies, privately printed, and is now very rare. It is an odd circumstance that in Lowell's library, from which Harvard College was allowed to select any volumes not in Gore Hall, neither this book nor any of Lowell's own early poems was to be found. The young couple took up their residence at Elmwood, and here were born three daughters and a son. All but one of his children died in infancy. Many of the tenderest of his poems refer with touching pathos to this bereavement. Such, for instance, are The Changeling and The First Snowfall. In 1845 appeared The Vision of Sir Lonfall, a genuine inspiration composed in two days in a sort of ecstasy of poetic fervor. That, more than anything, established his fame he recognized that he was dedicated to the muses. In 1846 he wrote, If I have any vocation, it is the making of verse. When I take my pen for that, the world opens itself ungrudgingly before me. Everything seems clear and easy, as it seems sinking to the bottom could be, as one leans over the edge of his boat in one of those dear coves at Fresh Pond. My true place is to serve the cause as a poet. Then my heart leaps before me into the conflict. The same year he began his Biglow papers in the Boston Courier. Such jeux d'esprit are apt to be ephemeral. Lowell's are immortal. They preserved in literary form a fast-fading dialect. They caught and embalmed the mighty issues of a tremendous world problem. Their influence was incalculable. He gathered them into a volume in 1848 and became corresponding editor of the Anti-Slavery Standard. 
fortunate man who throws himself into an unpopular cause which is in harmony with the right how different from wordsworth who attacked the ballot and took sides against reform lowell's penchant for satire was exemplified again the same year in his fable for critics in this lowell with no sparing hand laid on his portraits most droll and most amusing colors it is a comic portrait gallery a series of caricatures whose greatest value as in all good caricatures lies in the accurate presentation of characteristic features he did not spare himself there is lowell whose striving parnassus to climb with a whole bale of isms tied together with rhyme he might get on alone, spite of troubles and boulders, but he can't with that bundle he has on his shoulders. The top of the hill he will ne'er come nigh reaching till he learns the distinctions twixt singing and preaching. His lyre has some chords that would ring pretty well, but he'd rather by half make a drum of the shell and rattle away till he's old as Methuselah at the head of a march to the last New Jerusalem some of his thrusts left embittered feelings but in general the tone was so good-natured that only the thin-skinned could object and it must be confessed many of his judgments have been confirmed by time in eighteen fifty one lowell visited europe and spent upwards of a year widening his acquaintance with the polite languages but it is remarkable that lowell gave the world almost no metrical translations Shortly after his return, his wife died, October 27, 1853, after a slow decline. In reference to this bereavement, Longfellow wrote his beautiful poem, The Two Angels. The following year, Longfellow resigned the Smith Professorship of the French and Spanish Languages and Literature and Belles Lettres, and Lowell was appointed his successor with two years' leave of absence. He had won his spurs. He had collected his poems in two volumes, not including A Year's Life, The Biglow Papers, or The Fable for Critics. He was known as one of the most brilliant contributors to Putnam's Monthly and other magazines. In 1854, he delivered a series of twelve lectures on English poetry before the Lowell Institute. Ten years before, he had published a volume of Conversations on the Poets. The contrast between the two works is no less pronounced than that between his earlier and later poems. In both, however, there is a tendency toward a confusing over-elaboration. Metaphors trample on the heels of similes, and quaint and often grotesque conceits sometimes pall upon the taste, just as in the poems a flash of incongruous wit sometimes disturbs the serenity that is desirable. On his return from Europe, Mr. Lowell occupied the chair which he adorned by his brilliant attainments and made memorable by his fame. He lectured on Dante, Shakespeare, Chaucer, and Cervantes, and delighted his audiences. At the same time, he was editor of the Atlantic Monthly for several years. From 1863 until 1872, he was associated with Professor Charles Eliot Norton in the conduct of the North American Review. In 1857, he married Miss Frances Dunlop of Portland, Maine, a cultivated lady who had been the governess of his daughter. She had unerring literary taste and sound judgment, and Mr. Lowell soon came to entrust to her the management of his financial affairs. She was enabled to make their comparatively small income more than meet the exigencies of an exacting position. The second series of the Biglow Papers, relating to the War of the Rebellion, were first published in the Atlantic. They were collected into a volume in 1865. That year was rendered notable by his Commemoration Ode, the worthy crowning of one of the grandest poetic opportunities ever granted to man. Under the Willows appeared in 1869, the Cathedral in 1870. In 1864, he had issued a collection of his early descriptive articles under the title Fireside Travels, in 1870 came Among My Books. The second series followed in 1876. My Study Windows was published in 1871. All these prose works were marked by an exuberant, vivid, poetic, impassioned style. The tropical efflorescence of imagery was characteristic of them all. He ought to have remembered his own words. Over-ornament ruins both poem and prose. In 1876 appeared three memorial poems, 
that read at concord april nineteenth eighteen seventy five that read at cambridge under the washington elm july third eighteen seventy five and the fourth of july ode of eighteen seventy six this year mr lowell was appointed one of the presidential electors and the following year president hayes first offered him the austrian mission and on his refusal of that gave him the honorary post at madrid which had been adored by everett irving and prescott he was there three years and on the retirement of mr welsh in eighteen eighty was transferred to the court of st james or as one of the english papers expressed it he became his excellency the ambassador of american literature to the court of shakespeare he was extremely popular known in private as one of the most marvellous of storytellers he became the lion of many public occasions the london news spoke of the extraordinary felicity of his occasional speeches at birmingham he delivered a notable address on democracy he was selected to deliver the oration at the dedication of the dean stanley memorial he spoke on fielding at taunton on coleridge at westminster abbey on gray at cambridge he was president of the wordsworth society all sorts of honors were heaped upon him both at home and abroad he returned to America in 1885, and once more occupied the somewhat dilapidated historic mansion at Elmwood. Once more he moved amid his rare and precious books, and heard the birds singing in the elms that his father had planted, or in the clustered bushes back of the house. He took a deep interest in the struggle for international copyright. He was president of the American Copyright League, and wrote the memorable lines, in vain we call old notions fudge and bend our conscience to our dealing the ten commandments will not budge and stealing will continue stealing he used the leisure of his failing health in revising his works his last volume of poems was entitled heart's ease and rue one of his latest poems my book appeared in the christmas number of the new york ledger in eighteen ninety in the december number of the atlantic his hand was visible in the anonymous Contributors Club. During the last years, his health was a matter of grave anxiety to his friends. In the spring of 1891, he seemed better. He was engaged in writing a life of Nathaniel Hawthorne. When the present writer called to see him one beautiful spring day, he found him in his library, at that moment engaged in making suggestions for the inscriptions on the new Boston Public Library. His manner was the perfection of courtesy and high breeding. His keen eyes seemed to read the very soul. Simplicity and beautiful dignity, tempered by evident feebleness of health, made him a memorable figure. Toward the end of the summer he suddenly grew more seriously ill. He suffered severely, and his last words were, Oh, why don't you let me die? He drew his last breath in the early morning of August 12, 1891. He was buried at Mount Auburn, in the shadow of Indian Ridge, not far from Longfellow's grave, in a lot unenclosed and marked by no monument. Memorial services were held in many places. Lord Tennyson cabled a message of sympathy. England and America will mourn Mr. Lowell's death. They loved him, and he loved them. The Queen publicly expressed her respect and sorrow. Few men have left a deeper impress on their age. Few men have used noble powers more nobly. In private life and public station there is not a shadow to stain the whiteness of his fame. As a poet he stands in the front rank of those who have yet appeared in America. As a critic he was generous and just. As a humorist he used his shafts of ridicule only to wound wrong. As a statesman and diplomat he was actuated by broad, far-seeing views. As a man, he was a type to be upheld and followed. America has just cause to reverence his memory, and the whole English-speaking world, without geographical distinction, claims him as his own. Nathan Haskell Dole End of the Biographical Sketch Sonnet by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Jesse Zuba If some small savor creep into my rhyme of the old poets, 
if some words i use neglected long which have the lusty thews of that gold-haired and earnest-hearted time whose loving joy and sorrow all sublime have given our tongue its starry eminence it is not pride god knows but reverence which hath grown in me since my childhood's prime wherein i feel that my poor lyre is strung with soul-strings like to theirs and that i have no right to muse their holy graves among if i can be a custom fettered slave and in mine own true spirit am not brave to speak what rusheth upward to my tongue End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hakon's Lay by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Kane Mercer. Then Thorsten looked at Hakon, where he sate, mute as a cloud amidst the stormy hall, and said, O oh, Skald, sing now an olden song, such as our fathers heard who led great lives. And as the bravest on a shield is borne along the waving host that shouts him king, so rode their thrones upon the thronging seas. Then the old man arose, white-haired he stood, white-bearded with eyes that looked afar from their still region of perpetual snow. Over the little smokes and stirs of men, his head was bowed with the gathered flakes of years, as winter bends the sea for boarding pine, but something triumphed in his brow and eye, which whoso saw it could not see and crouch. Loud rang the empty beakers as he mewed, brooding his hurried thoughts. Then, as an eagle circles smooth-winged above the wind-vexed woods, so wheeled his soul into the air of song, high o'er the stormy hall, and thus he sang. The Fletcher for his arrow shaft picks out wood closest grained, long season, straight as light, and from a quiver full of such as these, the wary bowman matched against his peers, long doubting, singles yet one more the best. Who is it that can make shafts such as fate? What archer of his arrows is so choice, or hits the white so surely? They are men, the chosen of her quiver, nor for her. Will every reed suffice, or cross-grained stick, at random from life's vulgar faggot plucked? Such answer household ends, but she will have souls straight and clear, of toughest fibre, sound down to the heart of heart, from these she strips, all needless stuff, all sapwood, hardens them, from circumstance untoward feathers plucks, crumpled and cheap with barbs of iron will, the hour that passes is her quiver boy, when she draws bow, tis not across the wind, nor against the sun, her haste-snatched arrow sings, for sun and wind have plighted faith to her. Ere men have heard the sinew twang, behold, in the butt's heart her trembling messenger. The song is old and simple that I sing. Good were the days of yore, when men were tried by ring of shields as now by ring of gold. But while the gods are left, and hearts of men, and the free ocean, still the days are good. Through the broad earth roams opportunity, and knocks at every door of butt or hall, until she finds the brave soul that she wants. He ceased, and instantly the frothy tide of uninterrupted wassail roared along, but Leif, the son of Eric, sat apart, musing, and with his eyes upon the fire saw shapes of arrows, lost as soon as seen lint then with that resolve his heart was bent which like a humming shaft through many a stripe of day and night across the unventured seas shot the brave prow to cut the vinland sands the first rune in the saga of the west end of poem this recording is in the public domain out of doors by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org By Jesse Zuba Tis good to be abroad in the sun His gifts abide when day is done Each thing in nature from his cup Gathers a several virtue up The grace within its being's reach Becomes the nutriment of each And the same life imbibed by all Makes each most individual here the twig-bending peaches seek the glow that mantles in their cheek. Hence comes the Indian summer bloom that hazes round the basking plum. 
and from the same impartial light the grass sucks green the lily white like these the soul for sunshine made grows wan and grassle in the shade her faculties which god decreed various as summer's didal breed with one sad color are imbued shut from the sun that tints their blood the shadow of the poet's roof deadens the dyes of warp and woof whate'er of ancient song remains has fresh air flowing in its veins for greece and eldest ind knew well that out of doors with world-wide swell arches the student's lawful cell away on fruitful lore of books for whose vain idiom we reject the spirit's mother dialect aliens among the birds and brooks dull to interpret or believe what gospels lost the woods retrieve or what the eavesdropping violet reports from god who walketh yet his garden in the hush of eve away ye pedants city-bred unwise of heart too wise of head who handcuff art with thus and so and in each other's footprints tread like those who walk through drifted snow who from deep study of brick walls conjecture of the waterfalls by six square feet of smoke-stained sky compute those deeps that overlie the still tarn's heaven-anointed eye and in your earthen crucible with chemic tests essay to spell how nature works in field and dell seek we where shakespeare buried gold such hands no charmed witch-hazel hold to beech and rock repeats the sea the mystic open sesame old greylock's voices not in vain comment on milton's mountain strain and cunningly the various wind spencer's locked music can unbind End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Reverie by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist In the twilight deep and silent Comes thy spirit unto mine When the moonlight and the starlight Over cliff and woodland shine and the quiver of the river seems a thrill of joy benign. Then I rise and wander slowly to the headland by the sea, when the evening star throbs setting through the cloudy cedar tree, and from under mellow thunder of the surf comes fitfully. Then within my soul I feel thee like a gleam of other years, visions of my childhood murmur their old madness in my ears, till the pleasance of thy presence cools my heart with blissful tears. All the wondrous dreams of boyhood, all youth's fiery thirst of praise, all the sure hopes of manhood, blossoming in sadder days, joys that bound me, griefs that crowned me with a better wreath than bays, all the longings after freedom, the vague love of humankind, wandering far and near at random like a winged seed in the wind, the dim yearnings and fierce burnings of an undirected mind. All of these, O oh best beloved, happiest present, dreams and past, in thy love find safe fulfilment, ripened into truths at last, faith and beauty, hope and duty, to one centre, gather fast. How my nature, like an ocean, at the breath of thine awakes, leaps its shores in mad exulting, and in foamy thunder breaks, then down sinking, lieth shrinking at the tumult that it makes. Blazing Hesperus hath sunken low within the pale blue west, and with golden splendour crowneth the horizon's piny crest. Thoughtful quiet stills the riot of wild longing in my breast. Home I loiter through the moonlight underneath the quivering trees, which, as if a spirit stirred them, sway and bend till by degrees the far surge's murmur merges in the rustle of the breeze. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Sadness by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihikiti There is not in this life of ours one bliss unmixed with fears the hope that wakes our deepest powers a face of sadness wears 
and the dew that showers our dearest flowers is the bitter dew of tears fame waiteth long and lingereth through weary nights and morns and evermore the shadow death with mocking finger scorns that underneath the laurel wreath should be a wreath of thorns the laurel leaves are cool and green but the thorns are hot and sharp lean hunger grins and stares between the poet and his harp though of love's sunny sheen his woof have been grim want thrusts in the warp and if beyond this darksome clime some fair star hope may see that keeps unjarred the blissful chime of its golden infancy where the harvest time of faith sublime not always is to be yet would the true soul rather choose its home where sorrow is than in a sated peace to lose its life's supremest bliss the rainbow hues that bend profuse o'er cloudy spheres like this the want the sorrow and the pain that are love's right to cure the sunshine bursting after rain the gladness insecure that makes us fain strong hearts to gain to do and to endure high natures must be thunder scarred with many a searing wrong from mother sorrow's breasts the bard sucks gifts of deepest song nor all unmarred with struggles hard wax the soul's sinews strong dear patience too is born of woe patience that opes the gate where through the soul of man must go up to each nobler state whose voices flow so meek and low smooth the bent brows of fate though fame be slow yet death is swift and o'er the spirit's eyes life after life doth change and shift with larger destinies as on we drift some wider rift shows us serener skies and though naught falleth to us here but gains the world counts loss though all we hope of wisdom clear when climbed to seems but dross yet all though ne'er christ faith they wear at least may share his cross end of poem this recording is in the public domain farewell by james russell lowell read for LibriVox.org by sarah Soleri. Farewell, as the bee round the blossom doth murmur drowsily, so murmureth round my bosom the memory of thee. Lingering it seems to go when the wind more full doth flow, waving the flower to and fro, but still returneth Marian. My hope no longer burneth, which did so fiercely burn, my joy to sorrow turneth, although loath, loath to turn. I would forget, and yet, and yet my heart to thee still yearneth, Marian. Fair as a single star thou shinest, and white as lilies are the slender hands wherewith thou twinest thy heavy auburn hair. Thou art to me a memory of all that is divinest. Thou art so fair and tall, thy looks so queenly are, Thy very shadow on the wall, thy step upon the stair, The thought that thou art nigh, the chance look of thine eye, Are more to me than all, Marian, and will be till I die. As the last quiver of a bell doth fade into the air, With a subsiding swell that dies we know not where, So my hope melted and was gone. I raised mine eyes to bless the star that shared its light with me so far below its silver throne, and gloom and chilling vacancy were all was left to me. In the dark, bleak night I was alone, alone in the blessed earth, Marian, for what were all to me. It's love and light and mirth, Marian, if I were not with thee. My heart will not forget thee more than the morning brine forgets the moon when she is set. 
The gush when first I met thee, that thrilled my brain like wine, doth thrill as madly yet. My heart cannot forget thee, though it may droop and pine, too deeply it had set thee in every love of mine. No new moon ever cometh, no flower ever bloometh, no twilight ever gloometh, but I more only thine. O oh, look not on me, Marian, thine eyes are wild and deep, and they have won me, Marian, from peacefulness and sleep. The sunlight doth not sun me, the meek moonshine doth shun me, all sweetest voices stun me. There is no rest within my breast, and I can only weep, Marian. As a land bird far at sea doth wander through the sleet and drooping downward wearily, finds no rest for her feet, so wandereth my memory o'er the years when we did meet. I used to say that everything partook a share of thee, that not a little bird could sing or green leaf flutter on a tree, that nothing could be beautiful save part of thee were there, that from thy soul so clear and full all bright and blessed things did cull, the charm to make them fair. And now I know that it was so, thy spirit through the earth doth flow, and face me wheresoe'er I go. What right hath perfectness to give such weary weight of woe unto the soul which cannot live on anything more low? Oh, leave me, leave me, Marian, there's no fair thing I see but doth receive me, Marian, into sad dreams of thee. A cold snake gnaws my heart and crushes round my brain and I should glory but to part so bitterly again, feeling the slow tears start and fall in fiery rain. There's a wide ring around the moon, the ghost-like clouds glide by, and I hear the sad winds croon a dirge to the lowering sky. There's nothing soft or mild in the pale moon's sickly light but all look strange and wild through the dim, foreboding night. I think thou must be dead in some dark and lonely place, with candles at thy head and a pall above thee spread, to hide thy dead, cold face. But I can see thee underneath so pale and still and fair, thine eyes closed smoothly, and a wreath of flowers in thy hair. I never saw thy face so clear when thou wast with the living, as now beneath the pall, so drear and stiff and unforgiving. I cannot flee thee, Marian, I cannot turn away. Mine eyes must see thee, Marian, through salt tears night and day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Dirge by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org By Guest from San Diego, California A Dirge Poet, lonely is thy bed And the turf is overhead Cold earth is thy cover but thy heart hath found release and it slumbers full of peace neath the rustle of green trees and the warm hum of the bees mid the drowsy clover through thy chamber still as death a smooth gurgle wandereth as the blue stream murmureth to the blue sky over Three paces from the silver strand, Gently in the fine white sand, With a lily in thy hand, Pale as snow, they laid thee. In no coarse earth wast thou hid, And no gloomy coffin lid, Darkly overweighed thee. Silently as snowflakes drift, The smooth sand did sift and sift, O'er the bed they made thee. All sweet birds did come and sing At thy sunny burying, 
choristers unbidden, and beloved of sun and dew, meek forget-me-nots upgrew, where thine eyes so large and blue neath the turf were hidden. Where thy stainless clay doth lie, blue and open is the sky, and the white clouds wander by, dreams of summer silently darkening the river. Thou hearest the clear water run, and the ripples every one, scattering the golden sun, through thy silence quiver. Vines trail down upon the stream, into its smooth and glassy dream, a green stillness spreading, and the shiner perch and bream, through the shadowed waters gleam, against the current heading. White as snow thy winding sheet shelters thee from head to feet, save thy pale face only. Thy face is turned toward the skies, the lids lie meekly o'er thine eyes, and the low-voiced pine tree sighs o'er thy bed so lonely. All thy life thou lovest its shade, underneath it thou art laid in an endless shelter. Thou hearest it forever sigh, as the wind's vague longings die, in its branches dim and high. Thou hearest the waters gliding by, slumberously welter. Thou wast full of love and truth, of forgiveness and ruth, thy great heart with hope and youth, tided to or flowing. Thou didst dwell in mysteries, and there lingered on thine eyes shadows of serener skies, awfully wild memories that were like foreknowing. Through the earth thou wouldst have gone, lighted from within alone, seeds from flowers in heaven grown, with a free hand sowing. Thou didst remember well and long some fragments of thine angel song, and strive through want of woe and wrong to win the world unto it. Thy sin it was to see and hear beyond today's dim hemisphere, beyond all mists of hope and fear, into a life more true and clear, and dearly thou didst rue it. Light of the new world thou hadst won, or flooded by a purer sun, slowly fate's ship came drifting on, and through the dark, save thou, not one, caught of the land a token. Thou stoodst upon the farthest prow, something within thy soul said now, and leaping forth with eager brow, Thou feltst on shore heartbroken. Long time thy brethren stood in fear, Only the breakers far and near, White with their anger they could hear, The sounds of land, Which thy quick ear caught long ago, They heard not. And when at last they reached the strand, They found thee lying on the sand, With some wild flowers in thy hand, but thy cold bosom stirred not. They listened, but they heard no sound, save from the glad life all around, a low contented murmur. The long grass flowed adown the hill, a hum rose from a hidden rill, but thy glad heart that knew no ill, but too much love, lay dead and still. The only thing that sent a chill into the heart of summer. Thou didst not seek the poet's wreath, but too soon didst win it. Without twas green, but underneath 
were scorn and loneliness and death, gnawing the brain with burning teeth and making mock within it. Thou who wast full of nobleness, whose very life-blood twas to bless, whose soul's one law was giving, must bandy words with wickedness, haggle with hunger and distress, to win that death which worldliness calls bitterly a living. Thou sowest no gold, and shalt not reap, muttered earth, turning in her sleep. Come home to the eternal deep, murmured a voice, and a wide sweep of wings through thy soul's hush did creep, as of thy doom or flying. It seemed that thy strong heart would leap out of thy breast, and thou didst weep, but not with fear of dying. Men could not fathom thy deep fears, they could not understand thy tears, the hoarded agony of years of bitter self-denying. So once when high above the spheres thy spirit sought its starry peers, it came not back to face the jeers of brothers who denied it. Star-crowned, thou dost possess the deeps of God, and thy white body sleeps, where the lone pine forever keeps patient watch beside it. Poet, underneath the turf, soft thou sleepest, free from morrow, thou hast struggled through the surf of wild thoughts and want and sorrow. Now beneath the moaning pine, full of rest, thy body lieth, while far up is clear sunshine, underneath a sky divine, her lucid wings thy spirit trieth. Oft she strove to spread them here, but they were too white and clear for our dingy atmosphere. Thy body findeth ample room in its still and grassy tomb by the silent river. But thy spirit found the earth narrow for the mighty birth which it dreamed of ever. Thou wast guilty of a rhyme learned in a benigner clime, and of that more grievous crime an ideal too sublime for the low-hung sky of time. The calm spot where thy body lies gladdens thy soul in paradise. It is so still and holy. Thy body sleeps serenely there, and well for it thy soul may care. It was so beautiful and fair, lily-white so holy. From so pure and sweet a frame, thy spirit parted as it came, gentle as a maiden. Now it lieth full of rest, sods are lighter on its breast, than the great prophetic guest wherewith it was laden. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fancies about a rosebud, pressed in an old copy of Spencer, by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Megan Larson. Who pressed you here? The past can tell when summer skies were bright above and some full heart did leap and swell beneath the white new moon of love. Some poet haply when the world showed like a calm sea, grand and blue, ere its cold inky waves had curled o'er the numb heart once warm and true, when with his soul brimful of morn he looked beyond the veil of time, nor saw therein the dullard scorn that made his heavenliness a crime. 
when, musing o'er the poet's olden, his soul did like a sun upstart to shoot its arrows, clear and golden, through slavery's cold and darksome heart. Alas, too soon the veil is lifted that hangs between the soul and pain. Too soon the morning red hath drifted into dull cloud or fallen in rain. Or were you pressed by one who nursed bleak memories of love gone by? whose heart, like a star fallen, burst in dark and erring vacancy. To him you still were fresh and green as when you grew upon the stalk, and many a breezy summer scene came back, and many a moonlit walk, and there would be a hum of bees, a smell of childhood in the air. And old fresh feelings cooled the breeze that like loved fingers stirred his hair. Then would you suddenly be blasted by the keen wind of one dark thought, one nameless woe that had outlasted the sudden blow whereby twas brought. Or were you pressed here by two lovers who seemed to read these verses rare, but found between the antique covers what Spencer could not prison there, songs which his glorious soul had heard, but his dull pen could never write, which flew like some gold-winged bird through the blue heaven out of sight, my heart is with them as they sit. I see the rosebud in her breast. I see her small hand taking it from out its odorous snowy nest. I hear him swear that he will keep it in memory of that blessed day to smile on it or overweep it when she and spring are far away. Ah, me! I needs must droop my head and brush away a happy tear, for they are gone and dry and dead the rosebud lies before me here. Yet it is in no stranger's hand, for I will guard it tenderly, and it shall be a magic wand to bring mine own true love to me. My heart runs o'er with sweet surmises, the while my fancy weaves her rhyme. Kind hopes and musical surprises throng round me from the olden time. I do not care to know who pressed you, Enough for me to feel and know that some heart's love and longing blessed you, knitting today with long ago. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. New Year's Eve, 1844, by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox by Scott Bennett. June twenty second, two 2015, Gordonsville, Tennessee. New Year's Eve, 1844. A Fragment. The night is calm and beautiful. The snow sparkles beneath the clear and frosty moon and the cold stars, as if it took delight in its own silent whiteness. The hushed earth sleeps in the soft arms of the embracing blue, secure as if angelic squadrons yet encamped about her, and each watching star gained double brightness from the flashing arms of winged and unsleeping sentinels. Upward the calm of infinite silence deepens, the sea that flows between high heaven and earth, musing by whose smooth brink we sometimes find a stray leaf floated from those happier shores, and hope, perchance not vainly, that some flower which we had watered with our holiest tears pale blooms, and yet our scanty garden's best, or the same ocean piloted by love, may find a haven at the feet of God, and be not wholly worthless in his sight. O oh, high dependence on a higher power, Soul stay for all these restless faculties that wander Ishmael-like the desert bare wherein our human knowledge hath its home, shifting their light-framed tents from day to day with each new-found oasis, wearied soon and only certain of uncertainty. O mighty humbleness that feels with awe, yet with a vast exulting feels no less that this huge minster of the universe, whose smallest oratories are glorious worlds 
with painted aureoles of dawn and sunset, whose carved ornaments are systems grand, Orion kneeling in his starry niche, the lyre whose strings give music audible to holy ears and countless splendors more, crowned by the blazing cross, high hung o'er all, whose organ music is the solemn stops of endless change, breathed through by endless good, whose choristers are all the morning stars, whose altar is the sacred human heart whereon love's candles burn unquenchably, trimmed day and night by gentle-handed peace, with all its arches and its pinnacles that stretch forever and forever up, is founded on the silent heart of God, silent yet pulsing forth exhaustless life through the least veins of all created things. Fit musings these for the departing year, and God be thanked for such a crystal night as fills the spirit with good store of thoughts that, like a cheering fire of walnut, crackle upon the hearthstone of the heart and cast a mild home glow o'er all humanity. Yes, though the poison shafts of evil doubts assail the skyey panoply of faith, though the great hopes which we have had for man, foes in disguise, because they based belief on man's endeavor, not on God's decree. Though these proud visaged hopes, once turned to fly, hurl backward many a deadly Parthian dart that rankles in the soul and makes it sick with vain regret, nigh verging on despair. Yet, in such calm and earnest hours as this, we well can feel how every living heart that sleeps tonight in palace or in cot or unroofed hovel or which need hath known of other homestead than the arching sky is circled watchfully with seraph fires. How our own erring will it is that hangs the flaming sword or Eden's unclosed gate which gives free entrance to the pure in heart, and with its guarding walls doth fence the meek. Sleep then, O earth, in thy blue vaulted cradle, bent over always by thy mother heaven. We all are tall enough to reach God's hand, and angels are no taller. Looking back upon the smooth wake of a year or past, we see the black clouds furling, one by one, from the advancing majesty of truth, and something won for freedom, whose least gain is as a firm and rock-built citadel wherefrom to launch fresh battle on her foes, or, leaning from the time's extremest prow, if we gaze forward through the blinding spray and dimly see how much of ill remains, how many fetters to be sawn asunder by the slow toil of individual zeal, or haply rusted by salt tears in twain, we feel, with something of a sadder heart, yet bracing up our bruised mail the while and fronting the old foe with fresher spirit, how great it is to breathe with human breath, to be but poor foot soldiers in the ranks of our old exiled king, humanity, encamping after every hard-won field nearer and nearer heaven's happy plains. Many great souls have gone to rest and sleep under this armor, free and full of peace. If these have left the earth, yet truth remains, endurance, too, the crowning faculty of noble minds, and love, invincible by any weapons, and these hem us round with silence, such that all the groaning clank of this mad engine men have made of earth dulls not some ears for catching purer tones, that wander from the dim surrounding vast, or far more clear melodious prophecies, the natural music of the heart of man, which by kind sorrow's ministry hath learned that the true scepter of all power is love and humbleness, the palace gate of truth. 
What man with soul so blind as sees not here the first faint tremble of hope's morning star, foretelling how the God-forged shafts of dawn, fitted already on their golden string, shall soon leap earthward with exulting flight to thrid the dark heart of that evil faith whose trust is in the clumsy arms of force, the osier hauberk of a ruder age. Freedom, thou other name for happy truth, thou warrior maid, whose still-clad feet were never out of the stirrup, nor thy lance uncouched, nor thy fierce eye enticed from its watch. Thou hast learned now, by hero blood in vain poured to enrich the soil which tyrants reap by wasted lives of prophets, and of those who by the promise in their souls upheld into the red arms of a fiery death, went blithely as the golden-girdled bee sinks in the sleepy poppy's cup of flame, by the long woes of nations set at war, that so the swollen torrent of their wrath may find a vent else sweeping off like straws the thousand cobweb threads, grown cable-huge by time's long-gathered dust, but cobwebs still, which bind the many that the few may gain leisure to wither by the drought of ease, what heavenly germs in their own souls were sown. By all these searching lessons, Thou hast learned to throw aside thy blood-stained helm and spear, and with thy bare brow daunt the enemy's front, knowing that God will make the lily stalk in the soft grasp of naked gentleness, stronger than iron spear to shatter through the sevenfold toughness of wrong's idle shield. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Mystical Ballad by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox by Scott Bennett June 23, 2015, Gordonsville, Tennessee A Mystical Ballad One The sunset scarce had dimmed away into the twilight's doubtful gray, one long cloud o'er the horizon lay, neath which a streak of bluish white wavered between the day and night. Over the pine trees on the hill the trembly evening star did thrill, and the new moon, with slender rim, through the elm arches gleaming dim, filled memory's chalice to the brim. Two. On such an eve the heart doth grow full of surmise, and scarce can know if it be now or long ago, or if indeed it doth exist. A wonderful enchanted mist from the new moon doth wander out, wrapping all things in mystic doubt, so that this world doth seem untrue, and all our fancies to take hue from some life ages since gone through. 3. The maiden sat and heard the flow of the west wind so soft and low, the leaves scarce quivered to and fro. Unbound, her heavy golden hair rippled across her bosom bare, which gleamed with thrilling snowy white far through the magical moonlight. The breeze rose with a rustling swell, and from afar there came the smell of a long-forgotten lily bell. 4. The dim moon rested on the hill, but silent, without thought or will, where sat the dreamy maiden still? And now the moon's tip like a star, drew down below the horizon's bar. To her black noon the night hath grown, yet still the maiden sits alone, pale as a corpse beneath a stream, and her white bosom still doth gleam through the deep midnight like a dream. 5. Cloudless the morning came, and fair, and lavishly the sun doth share his gold, 
among her golden hair, kindling it all, till slowly so a glory round her head doth glow. A withered flower is in her hand, that grew in some far distant land, and silently transfigured, with wide, calm eyes and undrooped head, they found the stranger maiden dead. 6. A youth that morn neath other skies felt sudden tears burn in his eyes, and his heart throng with memories. All things without him seemed to win strange brotherhood with things within, and he forever felt that he walked in the midst of mystery, and thenceforth, why he could not tell, his heart would curdle at the smell of his once cherished lily bell. 7. Something from him had passed away, some shifting trembles of clear day, through starry crannies in his clay, grew bright and steadfast more and more, where all had been dull earth before, and through these chinks, like him of old, his spirit converse high did hold with clearer loves and wider powers that brought him dewy fruits and flowers from far Elysian groves and bowers. 8. Just on the farther bound of sense, unproved by outward evidence, but known by a deep influence, which through our grosser clay doth shine with light unwaning and divine, Beyond where highest thought can fly, stretcheth the world of mystery, and they not greatly overween who deem that nothing true hath been save the unspeakable unseen. 9. One step beyond life's workday things, one more beat of the soul's broad wings, one deeper sorrow sometimes brings the spirit into that great vast where neither future is nor past. None knoweth how he entered there, but waking finds his spirit where he thought an angel could not soar, and what he called false dreams before, the very air about his door. 10. These outward seemings are but shows whereby the body sees and knows far down beneath. Forever flows a stream of subtlest sympathies that make our spirit strangely wise in awe and fearful bodings dim which from the sense's outer rim stretch forth beyond our thought and sight fine arteries of circling light pulsed outward from the infinite. End of poem. This reading is in the public domain. Opening Poem to a Year's Life by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lou Key Hope first the youthful poet leads, and he is glad to follow her, Kind is she, and to all his needs, with a free hand doth minister. But when sweet hope at last hath fled, cometh her sister, memory. She wreathes hope's garlands round her head, and strives to seem as fair as she. Then hope comes back, and by the hand, she leads a child most fair to see, who with a joyous face doth stand, uniting hope and memory. So brighter grew the earth around, and bluer grew the sky above. The poet now his guide hath found, and follows in the steps of love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dedication to Volume of Poems Entitled A Year's Life by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Lou Key The gentle Una I have loved, The snowy maiden, pure and mild, Since ever by her side I roved, Through ventures strange, a wandering child, In fantasy 
a red cross knight, burning for her dear sake to fight. If there be one who can, like her, make sunshine in life's shady places, one in whose holy bosom stir as many gentle household graces, and such I think there needs must be, will she accept this book from me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Serenade by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Scott Bennett Gordonsville, Tennessee Gentle lady, be thy sleeping, Peaceful may thy dreamings be, while around thy soul is sweeping dreamy-winged our melody. Chant we, brothers, sad and slow, let our song be soft and low as the voice of other years. Let our hearts within us melt to gentleness as if we felt the dropping of our mother's tears. Lady, now our song is bringing back again thy childhood's hours, Hearest thou the humbee singing drowsily among the flowers? Sleepily, sleepily in the noontide swayeth he, Half rested on the slender stalks that edge those well-known garden walks. Hearest thou the fitful whirrings of the humbird's viewless wings? Feelst not round thy heart the stirring of childhood's half-forgotten things? Seest thou the dear old dwelling, with the woodbine round the door. Brother soft, her breast is swelling with the busy thoughts of yore. Lowly sing ye, sing ye mildly, house her spirit not so wildly, lest she sleep not any more. Tis the pleasant summer tide, open stands the window wide, whose voices, lady, art thou drinking? Who sings the best beloved tune in a clear note, Rising, sinking, like a thrush's song in June. Whose laugh is that which rings so clear and joyous in thine eager ear? Lower, brothers, yet more low, weave the song in mazy twines. She heareth now the west wind blow at evening through the clump of pines. Oh, mournful is their tune, as of a crazed thing, who to herself alone is ever murmuring through the night and through the day for something that hath passed away. Often, lady, hast thou listened, often have thy blue eyes glistened where the summer evening breeze moaned sadly through those lonely trees, or with the fierce wind from the north rung their mournful music forth. Ever the river floweth in an unbroken stream, Ever the west wind bloweth, murmuring as he goeth, And mingling with her dream. Onward still the river sweepeth with a sound of long agone. Lowly brothers, lo, she weepeth, she is now no more alone. Long-loved forms and long-loved faces round about her pillow throng, through her memory's desert places flow the waters of our song. Lady, if thy life be holy as when thou wert yet a child, though our song be melancholy, it will stir no anguish wild. For the soul that hath lived well, for the soul that childlike is, there is quiet in the spell that brings back early memories. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Scott Bennett 1. Lift up the curtains of thine eyes and let their light out shine. Let me adore the mysteries of those mild orbs of thine. Whichever queenly calm do roll, attuned to an ordered soul. 2. Open thy lips yet once again, and while my soul doth hush with awe, 
pour forth that holy strain which seemeth me to gush, a fount of music running o'er from thy deep spirit's inmost core. 3. The melody that dwells in thee begets in me as well a spiritual harmony, a mild and blessed spell. Far, far above earth's atmosphere, I rise whene'er thy voice I hear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Departed by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org, by Scott Bennett. Not they alone are the departed, who have laid them down to sleep in the grave, narrow and lonely. Not for them only do I vigils keep. Not for them only am I heavy-hearted. Not for them only. Many, many, there are many who no more are with me here, as cherished, as beloved as any whom I have seen upon the bier. I weep to think of those old faces, to see them in their grief or mirth. I weep, for there are empty places around my heart's once crowded hearth. The cold ground doth not cover them, the grass hath not grown over them, yet are they gone from me on earth. Oh, how more bitter is this weeping than for those lost ones who are sleeping where sun will shine and flowers blow, where gentle winds will whisper low, and the stars have them in their keeping. Wherefore from me who loved you so, oh, wherefore did you go? I have shed full many a tear, I have wrestled oft in prayer, but ye do not come again. How could anything so dear, how could anything so fair, vanish like the summer rain? No, no, it, it cannot be, but you're still with me, and yet, oh, where art thou, childhood, with sunny brow and floating hair? Where art thou hiding now? I have sought thee everywhere, all among the shrubs and flowers of those garden walks of ours. Thou art not there. When the shadow of night's wings hath darkened all the earth, I listen for thy gamblings beside the cheerful hearth. Thou art not there. I listen to the far-off bell. I murmur o'er the little songs which thou didst love so well. Pleasant memories come in throngs, and mine eyes are blurred with tears, but no glimpse of thee appears. Lonely am I in the winter, Lonely in the spring, summer and harvest bring no trace of thee. O oh, whither, whither art thou wandering, thou who didst once so cleave to me? And love is gone. I have seen him come, I have seen him to depart, leaving desolate his home, his bright home in my heart. I am alone, cold. Cold is his hearthstone, wide open stands the door. The frolic and the gentle one shall I see no more, no more. At the fount the bowl is broken, I shall drink it not again. All my longing prayers are spoken and felt. Ah, woe is me in vain. O oh, childish hopes and childish fancies, whither have ye fled away? I long for you in mournful trances, I long for you by night and day. Beautiful thoughts that once were mine, might I but win you back once more. Might ye about my being twine and cluster as ye did of yore. Oh, do not let me pray in vain. How good and happy I should be, how free from every shade of pain, if ye would come again to me. Oh, come again, come, come again. Hath the sun forgot its brightness? Have the stars forgot to shine, that they bring not their wonted lightness to this weary heart of mine? Tis not the sun that shone on thee, happy childhood, long ago, not the same stars silently looking on the same bright snow, 
not the same that love and I together watched in days gone by. No, not the same, alas, for me. Would God that those who early went to the house dark and low, for whom our morning heads were bent, for whom our steps were slow, oh, would that these alone had left us, that fate of these alone had reft us, would God indeed that it were so. Many leaves too soon must wither, many flowers too soon must die, many bright ones wandering hither, we know not whence, we know not why, like the leaves and like the flowers vanish, ere the summer hours that brought them to us have gone by. Oh, for the hopes and for the feelings, childhood, that I shared with thee, the high resolves, the bright revealings of the soul's might which thou gavest me. Gentle love, woe worth the day, woe worth the hour when thou wert born, woe worth the day thou fledst away. A shade across the wind waved corn, a dewdrop falling from the leaves, chance shaken in a summer's morn. Woe, woe is me, my sick heart grieves, companionless and anguish worn, I know it well, our manly years must be baptized in bitter tears, full many fountains must run dry, that youth has dreamed for long hours by, choked by convention's siroc blast, or drifting sands of many cares, slowly, they leave us all at last, and cease their flowing unawares. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Bobolink by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Scott Bennett. Anna Crean of the Meadow, drunk with the joy of spring, Beneath the tall pine's voiceful shadow I lie and drink thy jargoning. My soul is full with melodies. One drop would overflow it and send the tears into mine eyes. But what carest thou to know it? Thy heart is free as mountain air, and of thy lays thou hast no care, scattering them gaily everywhere, happy unconscious poet. Upon a tuft of meadow grass, while thy loved one tends the nest, thou swayest as the breezes pass, unburthening thine o'erfull breast of the crowded songs that fill it, just as joy may choose to will it. Lord of thy love and liberty, the blithest bird of merry May, thou turnest thy bright eyes on me, that say as plain as I can say, here sit we, here in the summer weather, I and my modest mate together. Whatever your wise thoughts may be under that gloomy old pine tree, we do not value them a feather. Now, leaving earth and me behind, thou beatest up against the wind, or floating slowly down before it, above thy grass-hid nest thou flutterest, and thy bridal love-song utterest raining showers of music o'er it. Weary never, still thou trillest, spring gladsome lays, as of moss-rimmed water-brooks murmuring through pebbly nooks in quiet summer days. My heart with happiness thou fillest, I seem again to be a boy watching thee, gay, blithesome lover, o'er the bending grass-tops hover, quivering thy wings for joy. There's something in the apple blossom, the greening grass and bobolink's song, that wakes again within my bosom feelings which have slumbered long. As long, long years ago I wandered, I seem to wander even yet. The hours the idle schoolboy squandered, the man would die ere he'd forget. O oh, hours that frosty eld deemed wasted, nodding his gray head toward my books, I dearer prize the lore I tasted with you, 
among the trees and brooks, than all that I have gained since then from learned books or study withered men. Nature, thy soul was one with mine, and as a sister by a younger brother is loved, each flowing to the other, such love for me was thine. Or wert thou not more like a loving mother with sympathy and loving power to heal, against whose heart my throbbing heart I'd lay and moan my childish sorrows all away, till calm and holiness would o'er me still? Was not the golden sunset a dear friend? Found I no kindness in the silent moon and the green trees whose tops did sway and bend, low singing evermore their pleasant tune? Felt I no heart in dim and solemn woods, no loved one's voice in lonely solitudes? Yes, yes, unhoodwinked then my spirit's eyes, blind leaders had not taught me to be wise. Dear hours, which now again I overlive, hearing and seeing with the ears and eyes of childhood, ye were bees that to the hive of my young heart came laden with rich prize, gathered in fields and woods and sunny dells to be my spirit's food in days more wintry. Yea, yet again ye come, ye come, and like a child once more at home after long sojourning in alien climes, I lie upon my mother's breast, feeling the blessedness of rest, and dwelling in the light of other times. O ye whose living is not life, whose dying is but death, song, empty toil, and petty strife, rounded with loss of breath, go, look on nature's countenance, drink in the blessing of her glance, look on the sunset, hear the wind, the cataract, the awful thunder, go, worship by the sea, then, and then only shall ye find with ever-growing wonder, man is not all in all to ye. Go with a meek and humble soul, then shall the scales of self unroll from off your eyes, the weary packs drop from your heavy-laden backs, and ye shall see, with reverent and hopeful eyes, glowing with newborn energies, how great a thing it is to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Forgetfulness by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Ken Masters. There's a haven of sure rest from the loud world's bewildering stress as a bird dreaming on her nest, as dew hid in a rose's breast, as Hesper in the glowing west. So the heart sleeps in thy calm deeps, serene forgetfulness. No sorrow in that place may be, the noise of life grows less and less, as moss far down within the sea, as in white lily caves a bee, as life in a hazy reverie. So the heart's wave in thy dim cave hushes forgetfulness. Duty and care fade far away, what toil may be we cannot guess. As a ship anchored in the bay, as a cloud at summer noon astray, as water blooms in a breezeless day. So neath thine eyes the full heart lies and dreams forgetfulness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by James Russell Lowell
Ralph Waldo Emerson Days I What reck I of the stars when I may gaze into thine eyes, O which the brown hair flowingly is parted maidenwise From thy pale forehead, calm and bright, over thy cheeks so rosy white. Two, what care I for the red moon rise? Far liefer would I sit and watch the joy within thine eyes Gush up at sight of it. Thyself, my queenly moon, shall be Ruling my heart's deep tides for me. 3. What heed I if the sky be blue? So are thy holy eyes, and bright with shadows ever new, Of changeful sympathies, which in thy soul's unruffled deep Rest evermore, but never sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poet by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Ken Masters He who hath felt life's mystery press on him like thick night, Whose soul hath known no history but struggling after light, He who hath seen dim shapes arise in the soundless depths of soul, which gaze on him with meaning eyes full of the mighty whole yet will no word of healing speak although he pray night long o oh, help me save me i am weak and ye are wondrous strong who in the midnight dark and deep hath felt a voice of might come echoing through the halls of sleep from the lone heart of night and starting from his restless bed hath watched and wept to know what meant that oracle of dread that stirred his being so he who hath felt how strong and great this godlike soul of man, And looked full in the eyes of fate since life and thought began, The armour of whose moveless trust knoweth no spot of weakness, Who hath trod fear into the dust beneath the feet of meekness. He who hath calmly borne his cross, Knowing himself the king of time, Nor counted it a loss to learn by suffering, And who hath worshipped woman still With a pure soul and lowly, Nor ever hath in deed or will Profaned her temple holy. He is the poet, him unto the gift of song is given, Whose life is lofty, strong, and true, who never fell from heaven. He is the poet, from his lips to live forevermore, Majestical as full-sailed ships the words of wisdom pour. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Flowers by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Soleri. Hail be thou, holy here be, growing on the ground, all in the Mount Calvary first wert thou found. Thou art good for many a sore. Thou healest many a wound. In the name of sweet Jesus, I take thee from the ground. Ancient Charm Verse Part 1 When from a pleasant ramble home, Fresh stored with quiet thoughts, I come, I pluck some wayside flower And press it in the choicest nook Of a much-loved and oft-read book. 
And when upon its leaves I look in a less happy hour, dear memory bears me far away unto her fairy bower. And on her breast my head I lay, while in a motherly sweet strain she sings me gently back again to bygone feelings until they seem children born of yesterday. Part 2 Yes, many a story of past hours I read in these dear withered flowers, and once again I seem to be lying beneath the old oak tree and looking up into the sky, through thick leaves rifted fitfully, lulled by the rustling of the vine or the faint low of far-off kind. And once again I seem to watch the whirling bubbles flee through shade and gleam alternately down the vine-bowered stream, or neath the odorous linden trees when summer twilight lingers long to hear the flowering of the breeze and unseen insects' slumberous song that mingle into one and seem like dim murmurs of a dream. Fair faces, too, I seem to see, smiling from pleasant eyes at me, and voices sweet I hear that, like remembered melody, flow through my spirit's ear. Part 3 A poem every flower is, and every leaf a line, and with delicious memories they fill this heart of mine. No living blossoms are so clear as these dead relics treasured here. One tells of love, of friendship one, Love's quiet after sunset time, when the all-dazzling light is gone, and with the soul's low vesper chime, o'er half its heaven doth outflow a holy calm and steady glow. Summer gay feast songs, summer dirges, in some a joy with sorrow merges. One sings the shadowed woods, and one the roar of ocean's everlasting surges, tumbling upon the beach's hard-beat floor or sliding backward from the shore, to meet the landward waves and slowly plunge once more. O flowers of grace, I bless ye all by the dear faces ye recall. Part 4 Upon the banks of life's deep streams full many a flower groweth, which with a wondrous fragrance teems and in the silent water gleams, and trembles as the water floweth, Many a one the wave up teareth, washing ever the roots away, and far upon its bosom beareth, to bloom no more in youth's glad May. As farther on the river runs, flowing more deep and strong, only a few pale scattered ones are seen the dreary banks along. And where those flowers do not grow, the river floweth dark and chill, its voice is sad, and with its flow mingles over a sense of ill. Then, poet, thou who gather dost of life's best flowers the brightest, O oh, take good heed, they be not lost, while the angry flood thou fightest. Part 5 In the cool grottoes of the soul, whence flows thought's crystal river, whence songs of joy forever roll to him who is the giver, there store thou them, where fresh and green their leaves and blossoms may be seen, a spring of joy that faileth never. There store thou them, and they shall be a blessing and a peace to thee, and in their youth and purity thou shalt be young forever. Then, with their fragrance rich and rare, thy living shall be rife, strength shall be thine thy cross to bear, and they shall be a chaplet fair, breathing a pure and holy air to crown thy holy life. Part 6 O poet, above all men blessed, take heed that thus thou store them. Love, hope, and faith shall ever rest, sweet birds, upon how sweet a nest, watchfully brooding o'er them. And from those flowers of paradise scatter thou many a blessed seed, wherefrom an offspring may arise to cheer the hearts and light the eyes of after-voyagers in their need. They shall not fall on stony ground, but yielding all their hundredfold, shall shed a peacefulness around, whose strengthening joy may not be told, so shall thy name be blessed of all, and thy remembrance never die. For of that seed shall surely fall in the fair garden of eternity. Exult then in the nobleness of this thy work so holy, 
yet be not thou one jot the less humble and meek and lowly. But let thine exaltation be the reverence of a bended knee, and by thy life a poem write, built strongly day by day, and on the rock of truth and right its deep foundations lay. Part 7 It is thy duty, guard it well, for unto thee hath much been given, and thou canst make this life a hell, or Jacob's ladder up to heaven. Let not thy baptism in life's wave make thee like him whom Homer sings, a sleeper in a living grave, callous and hard to outward things. But open all thy soul and sense to every blessed influence that from the heart of nature springs. Then shall thy life flowers be to thee when thy best years are told, as much as these have been to me, yea, more a thousandfold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lover by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Saleri Part 1 Go from the world from east to west. Search every land beneath the sky. You cannot find a man so blessed, a king so powerful as I, though you should seek eternally. Part 2 For I, a gentle lover, be, sitting at my loved one's side. She giveth her whole soul to me without a wish or thought of pride, and she shall be my cherished bride. Part 3 No show of gaudiness hath she, she doth not flash with jewels rare. In beautiful simplicity she weareth leafy garlands fair, or modest flowers in her hair. Part 4 Sometimes she dons a robe of green, sometimes a robe of snowy white, but in whatever garb she's seen, it seems most beautiful and right, and is the loveliest to my sight. Part 5 not I her lover am alone, yet unto all she doth suffice. None jealous is, and every one reads love and truth within her eyes, and deemeth her his own dear prize. Part 6 And so thou art eternal nature. Yes, bride of heaven, so thou art. Thou wholly lovest every creature, giving to each no stinted part, but filling every peaceful heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To EWG by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Lou Key. Dear child, dear happy girl, if thou pure heedless, untouched with all or serious thought, thy nature is not therefore less divine. Thou liest in Abraham's bosom all the year, and worships at the temple's inner shrine, God being with thee when we know it not. Wordsworth As through a strip of sunny light a white dove flashes swiftly on, so suddenly before my sight thou gleamst a moment and were gone, and yet I long shall bear in mind the pleasant thoughts thou leftst behind. Thou madest me happy with thine eyes, and happy with thine open smile, and as I write sweet memories, come thronging round me all the while. Thou madest me happy with thine eyes, and gentle feelings long forgot, looked up and oped their eyes, like violets when they see a spot of summer in the skies. Around thy playful lips did glitter, heat lightnings of a girlish scorn, Harmless they were, for nothing bitter in thy dear heart was ever born. That merry heart that could not lie within its warm nest quietly, but ever from each full dark eye was looking kindly night and morn. There was an archness in thine eyes, born of the gentlest mockeries, and thy light laughter rang as clear as water drops I loved to hear. In days of boyhood, as they fell, 
tinkling far down the dim still well and with its sound come back once more the feelings of my early years and half aloud i murmured o'er sure i have heard that sound before it is so pleasant in my ears whenever thou didst look on me i thought of merry birds and something of spring's melody came to me in thy words thy thoughts did dance and bound along like happy children in their play whose hearts run over into song for gladness of the summer's day and mine grew dizzy with the sight still feeling lighter and more light till joining hands they whirled away as blithe and merrily as they i bound a larch twig round with flowers which thou didst twine among thy hair and gladsome were the few short hours when i was with thee there so now that thou art far away safe nestled in thy warm clime in memory of a happier day i twine this simple wreath of rhyme dost mine how she whom thou dost love more than in light words may be said a coronal of a marineth wove about thy duly sobered head which kept itself a moment still that she might have her gentle will thy childlike grace and purity o oh, keep for evermore and as thou art still strive to be that on the farther shore of time's dark waters ye may meet and she may twine round thy brow a wreath of those bright flowers that grow where blessed angels set their feet end of poem this recording is in the public domain Isabel by James Russell Lowell read for librivox.org by Eliza Winters As the leaf upon the tree fluttering gleaming constantly such a lightsome thing was she my gay and gentle Isabel her heart was fed with love springs sweet and in her face you'd see it beat to hear the sound of welcome feet and were not mine so isabel she knew it not but she was fair and like a moonbeam was her hair that falls where flowing ripples are in summer evenings isabel her heart and tongue were scarce apart unwittingly her lips would part and love came gushing from her heart the woman's heart of Isabel. So pure her flesh garb, and like dew, that in her features glimmered through, each working of her spirit true, in wondrous beauty, Isabel. A sunbeam struggling through thick leaves, a reaper's song mid yellow sheaves, less gladsome were my spirit grieves, to think of thee, mild Isabel. I know not when I loved thee first, not loving I had been accursed, yet having loved my heart will burst, longing for thee, dear Isabel. With silent tears my cheeks are wet, I would be calm, I would forget, but thy blue eyes gaze on me yet, when stars have risen, Isabel. The winds mourn for thee, Isabel, the flowers expect thee in the dell, thy gentle spirit loved them well, and I for thy sake, Isabel. The sunsets seem less lovely now, than when, leaf checkered on thy brow, they fell as lovingly as thou, lingerest till moonrise, Isabel. At dead of night I seem to see thy fair, pale features constantly, upturned in silent prayer for me, or moveless clasped hands, Isabel. I call thee, thou dost not reply, the stars gleam coldly on thine eye, as like a dream thou flittest by, and leav'st me weeping, Isabel.
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Music by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Guest of San Diego, California Music I seem to lie with drooping eyes Dreaming sweet dreams Half longings and half memories in woods where streams with trembling shades and whirling gleams many and bright in song and light are ever ever flowing while the wind if we list to the rustling grass which numbers his footsteps as they pass seems scarcely to be blowing and the far-heard voice of spring from sunny slopes comes wandering calling the violets from the sleep that bound them under snowdrifts deep to open their childlike asking eyes on the new summer's paradise and mingled with the gurgling waters as the dreamy witchery of Achilles's silver-voiced daughters rose and fell with the heaving sea whose great heart swelled with ecstasy the song of many a floating bird winding through the rifted trees is dreamily half heard a sister stream of melodies rippled by the flutterings of rapture quivered wings and now beside a cataract i lie and through my soul from over me and under the never-ceasing thunder arousingly doth roll through the darkness all compact through the trackless sea of gloom sad and deep I hear it boom. At intervals the cloud is cracked, and a livid flash doth hiss downward from its floating home, lighting up the precipice and the never-resting foam with a dim and ghastly glare, which, for a heartbeat in the air, shows the sweeping shrouds of the midnight clouds and their wildly scattered hair. Now listening to a woman's tone, in a wood I sit alone, alone because our souls are one. All around my heart it flows, lulling me in deep repose. I fear to speak, I fear to move, lest I should Break the spell I love, low and gentle, calm and clear, into my inmost soul it goes, as if my brother dear, who is no longer here, had bended from the sky and murmured in my ear a strain of that high harmony which they may sing alone who worship round the throne. Now in a ferry boat, on the bright waves of song, full merrily I float, merrily float along. My helm is veered, I care not how, my white sail bellies over me, and bright as gold the ripples be that plash beneath the bow. Before, behind, they feel the wind, and they are dancing joyously, while faintly heard along the far-off shore, the surf goes plunging with a lingering roar, or anchored in a shadowy cove, entranced with harmonies, slowly I sink and rise as the slow waves of music move.
now softly dashing, bubbling, plashing, mazy, dreamy, faint and streamy. Ripples into ripples melt, not so strongly heard as felt. Now rapid and quick, while the heart beats thick, the music's silver wavelets crowd, distinct and clear, but never loud. And now all solemnly and slow, in mild deep tones they warble low like the glad song of angels when they sang good will and peace to men now faintly heard and far as if the spirit's ears had caught the anthem of a star chanting with his brother spheres in the midnight dark and deep when the body is asleep and wondrous shadows pour in streams from the twofold gate of dreams. Now onward roll the billows, swelling with a tempest sound of might, as a voice's doom foretelling to the silent ear of night. And now a mingled ecstasy of all sweet sounds it is, Oh, who may tell the agony of rapture such as this? I have drunk of the drink of immortals, I have drunk of the life-giving wine, and now I may pass the bright portals that open into a realm divine. I have drunk it through mine ears in the ecstasy of song, when mine eyes would fill with tears that its life were not more long. I have drunk it through mine eyes in beauty's every shape, and now around my soul it lies, no juice of earthly grape. Wings, wings are given to me, I can flutter, I can rise, like a new life gushing through me, sweep the heavenly harmonies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by James Russell Lowell, sung for LibriVox.org by Iswa, in Belgium, in June 2015. I must look on that sweet face once more before I die. God grant that it may lighten up with joy when I draw nigh. God grant that she may look on me as kindly as she seems. In the long night, the restless night, in the sunny land of dreams. I hoped, I thought, she loved me once, and yet I know not why. There is a coldness in her speech, and a coldness in her eye. Something that in another's look would not seem cold to me. And yet, like eyes, I feel it chill the heart of memory. She does not come to greet me so frankly as she did. And in her utmost openness, I feel there's something hid. She almost seems to shun me as if she thought that I might win her gentle heart again to feelings long gone by. I sought the first spring buds for her, the fairest and the best, and she wore them for their loveliness upon her spotless breast the blood root and the violet the frail anemone she wore them and alas i deemed it was for love of me 
as flowers in a dark some place stretch forward to the light so to the memory of her i turn by day and night as flowers in a dark some place grow thinned and pale and worn so is it with my darkened heart now that her light is gone the thousand little things that love doth treasure up for i and brood upon with moistened eyes when she that's loved away the word the look the smile the blush the ribbon that she wore each day they grow more dear to me and pain me more and more my face i cover with my hands and bitterly i weep that the quick gathering sands of life should choke a love so deep and that the stream so pure and bright must turn it from its track or to the hot springs whence it rose roll its full waters back as calm as doth the lily float close by the lake let's brim so calm and spotless down time stream her peaceful days did swim and i had longed and dreamed and prayed that closely by her side down to a haven still and sure my happy life might glide but now alas those golden days of youth and hope are o'er and i must dream those dreams of joy those guiltless dreams no more yet there is something in my heart that whispers ceaselessly would god that i might see that face once more before i die end of poem this recording is in the public domain eon they by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by eliza winters There is a light within her eyes, like gleams of wandering fireflies. From light to shade it leaps and moves, whenever in her soul arise the holy shapes of things she loves. Fitful it shines and changes ever, like starlit ripples on a river, or summer sunshine on the eaves of silver trembling poplar leaves where the lingering dewdrops quiver. I may not tell the blessedness her mild eyes send to me, the sunset-tinted haziness of their mysterious shine, the dim and holy mournfulness of their mellow light divine. The shadow of the lashes lie over them so lovingly that they seem to melt away in a doubtful twilight gray while I watch the stars arise in the evening of her eyes. I love it, yet I almost dread it, to think what it foreshadoweth, and when I muse how I have read that such strange light betokened death. Instead of firefly gleams I see wild corpse lights gliding waveringly. With wayward thoughts her eyes are bright, like shiftings of the northern light, hither, thither, swiftly glance they, in amazing twining dance they. Like ripply lights the sunshine weaves, thrown backward from a shaken nook, below some tumbling water brook. On the o'er-arching platon leaves, all through her glowing face they flit, and rest in the deep-dwelling place. Those fathomless blue eyes of hers, 
till from her burning soul relit while her upheaving bosom stirs they stream again across her face and with such hope and glory fill it death could not have the heart to chill it yet when their wild light fades again i feel a sudden sense of pain as if while yet her eyes were gleaming and like a shower of sunlit rain bright fancies from her face were streaming her trembling soul might flit away as swift and suddenly as they a wild inspired earnestness her inmost being fills an eager self-forgetfulness that speaks not what it wills but what unto her soul is given a living oracle from heaven which scarcely in her breast is born when on her trembling lips it thrills and like a burst of golden skies through storm clouds on a sudden torn like a glory of the morn beams marvelously from her eyes and then like a spring swollen river roll the deep waves of her full-hearted thought crested with sunlit spray her wild lips curve and quiver and my rapt soul on the strong tide up caught unwittingly is borne away lulled by a dreamful music ever far through the solemn twilight gray of hoary woods through valleys green which the trailing vine embowers and where the purple clustered grapes are seen deep glowing through rich clumps of waving flowers now over foaming rapids swept and with maddening rapture shook now gliding where the water plants have slept for ages in a moss-rimmed nook and woven by a wild-eyed band of earth-forgetting dreams i float to a delicious land by a sunset heaven spanned and musical with streams around the calm majestic forms and godlike eyes of early greece i see or listen till my spirit warms to songs of courtly chivalry or weep unmindful if my tears be seen for the meek suffering love of poor undine her thoughts are never memories but ever changeful ever new fresh and beautiful as dew that in a dell at noontide lies or at the close of summer day the pleasant breath of new-mown hay swiftly they come and pass as golden birds across the sun as light gleams on tall meadow grass which the wind just breathes upon and when she speaks her eyes i see down gushing through their silken lattices like stars that quiver tremblingly through leafy branches of the trees and her pale cheeks do flush and glow with speaking flashes bright and rare as crimson north lights on new-fallen snow from out the veiling of her hair her careless hair that scatters down on either side her eyes a waterfall leaf tinged with brown and lit with the sunrise when first i saw her not of earth but heavenly both in grief and mirth i thought her she did seem as fair and full of mystery as bodiless as forms we see in the rememberings of a dream a moonlit mist a strange dim light circled her spirit from my sight each day more beautiful she grew more earthly every day yet that mysterious moony hue faded not at all away she has a sister's sympathy with all the wanderers of the sky but most i've seen her bosom stir when moonlight round her fell for the wild moon it loveth her she loveth it as well and of their love perchance this grace was born into her wondrous face i cannot tell how it may be for both methinks can scarce be true still as she earthly grew to me she grew more heavenly too she seems one born in heaven with earthly feelings for while unto her soul are given more pure revealings 
of holiest love and truth. Yet is the mildness of her eyes made up of quickest sympathies, of kindliness and ruth. So, though some shade of awe doth stir our souls for one so far above us, we feel secure that she will love us, and cannot keep from loving her. She is a poem, which to me in speech and look is written bright, and to her life's rich harmony doth ever sing itself aright. Dear glorious creature, with eyes so dewy bright, and tenderest feeling itself revealing, in every look and feature, welcome as a homestead light, to one long wandering in a clouded night. O oh, lovelier for her woman's weakness, which yet is strongly mailed, in armor of courageous meekness, and faith that never failed. Early and late, at her soul's gate, sits chastity in warder wise. No thoughts unchallenged, small or great, go thence into her eyes. Nor may a low, unworthy thought beyond that virgin warder win. No one whose password is not ought may go without or enter in. I call her, seeing those pure eyes, the eve of a new paradise, which she by gentle word and deed, and look no less, doth still create about her, for her great thoughts breed a calm that lifts us from our fallen state, and makes us while with both her good and great. Nor is there memory wanting in our need, with stronger loving every hour turneth my heart to this frail flower, which, thoughtless of the world, hath grown to beauty and meek gentleness, here in a fair world of its own, by woman's instinct trained alone, a lily fair which God did bless, and which from nature's heart did draw love, wisdom, peace, and heaven's perfect law. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love's Altar by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Eliza Winters I built an altar in my soul, I builded it to one alone, And ever silently I stole, In happy days of long agone, To make rich offerings to that one. T'was garlanded with purest thought, and crowned with fancy's flowers bright, With choicest gems t'was all inwrought, Of truth and feeling, In my sight it seemed a spot of cloudless light. When I made my offering there, Like Cain's, the incense would not rise, Back on my heart down sank the prayer, And altar stone and sacrifice grew hateful, in my tear-dimmed eyes. O'ergrown with age's mosses green, The little altar firmly stands. It is not as it once hath been, A selfish shrine. These time-taught hands Bring incense now from many lands. Knowledge doth only widen love. The stream that lone and narrow rose Doth Deepening ever onward move, And with an even current flows, Calmer and calmer to the close. The love that in those early days Girt round my spirit like a wall, Hath faded like a morning haze, And flames, unpent by self's mean thrall, Rise clearly to the perfect all. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Impartiality by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Eliza Winters I cannot say a scene is fair Because it is beloved of thee, But I shall love to linger there For sake of thy dear memory. I would not be so coldly just As to love only what I must. 
I cannot say a thought is good, because thou foundest joy in it. Each soul must choose its proper food, which nature hath decreed most fit, but I shall ever deem it so, because it made thy heart o'erflow. I love thee for that thou art fair, and that thy spirit joys in aught, createth a new beauty there, with thine own dearest image fraught. And love, for others' sake that springs, gives half their charm to lovely things. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bellerophon by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Eliza Winters Dedicated to my friend John F. Heath I feel the bandages unroll That bound my inward seeing. Freed are the bright wings of my soul, Types of my godlike being. High thoughts are swelling in my heart And rushing through my brain. May I never more lose part In my soul's realm again. All things fair, where'er they be, In earth, or air, in sky, or sea, I have loved them all, And taken all within my throbbing breast. No more my spirit can be shaken From its calm and kingly rest. Love hath shed its light around me, Love hath pierced the shades that bound me, Mine eyes are opened, I can see the universe's mystery, The mighty heart and core of after and before. I see, and I am weak no more. Upward, upward evermore, To heaven's open gate I soar. Little thoughts are far behind me, Which, when custom weaves together, All the nobler men can tether. Cobwebs now no more can bind me. Now fold thy wings a little while, My tranced soul, and lie At rest on this calypso isle that floats in mellow sky. A thousand isles with gentle motion rock upon the sunset ocean. A thousand isles of thousand hues, how bright, how beautiful, how rare, into my spirit they infuse a purer, a diviner air. The earth is growing dimmer, and now the last faint glimmer hath faded from the hill. But in my high atmosphere the sunlight streameth red and clear, Fringing the islet still. Love lifts us to the sunlight. Though the whole world would be dark, love, wide love, is the one light. All else is but a fading spark. Love is the nectar which doth fill our soul's cups, even to overflowing, and warming heart in thought and will, doth lie within us mildly glowing, from its own center raying out beauty and truth on all without. Each on his golden throne, full royally alone, I see the stars above me, with scepter and with diadem, mildly they look down and love me. For I have ever yet loved them, I see their ever sleepless eyes, watching the growth of destinies, calm, sedate, the eyes of fate. They wink not, nor do roll, but search the depths of the soul, and in those mighty depths they see the germs of all futurity, waiting but the fitting time to burst and ripen into prime, as in the womb of Mother Earth the seeds of plants and forests lie age upon age and never die so in the souls of all men wait undyingly the seeds of fate chance breaks the clod and forth they spring filling blind men with wondering eternal stars with holy awe as if a present god i saw i look into those mighty eyes and see great destinies arise as in those of mortal men Feelings glow and fade again, 
All things below, all things above, are open to the eyes of love. Of knowledge love is master key. Knowledge of beauty passing dear is each to each and mutually. Each one doth make the other clear. Beauty is love, and what we love straightway is beautiful. So is the circle round and full, and so dear love doth live and move and have his being. Finding his proper food, by pure in seeing, in all things pure and good, which he at will doth cull. Like a joyous butterfly, hiving in the sunny bowers, of the soul's fairest flowers, or between the earth and sky, wandering at liberty for happy, happy hours. The thoughts of love are a posy, as this fair earth and all we see are the thoughts of deity. And love is ours by our birthright. He hath cleared mine inward sight, glorious shapes with glorious eyes, round about my spirit glance, shedding a mild and golden light on the shadowy face of night. To unearthly melodies, hand in hand, they weave their dance, while a deep ambrosial luster from their rounded limbs doth shine through many a rich and golden cluster of streaming hair divine. In our gross and earthly hours, we cannot see the love-given powers which ever round the soul await to do its sovereign will, when in its moments calm and still it reassumes its royal state, no longer sits with eyes downcast, a beggar dreaming of the past at its own palace gate. I too am a maker and a poet, through my whole soul I feel it and know it. My veins are fired with ecstasy, all Mother Earth did ne'er give birth to one who shall be matched with me. The luster of my coronal shall cast a dimness over all. Alas, alas, what have I spoken? My strong, my eagle wings are broken, and back again to earth. I fall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Something Natural by James Russell Lowell Reading by Kevin Powell Fredericksburg, Virginia, 2015 Something Natural When first I saw thy soul-deep eyes, My heart yearned to thee instantly. Strange longing in my soul did rise. I cannot tell the reason why, But I must love thee till I die. The sight of thee hath well nigh grown As needful to me as the light. I am unrestful when alone, and my heart doth not beat aright, except it dwell within my sight. And yet, O oh yet, O oh selfish love, I'm not happy even with thee. I see thee in thy brightness move, and cannot well contented be, save thou shouldst shine alone for me. We should love beauty even as flowers, for all, tis said, they bud and blow. They are the world's as well as ours. But thou, alas, God made thee grow so fair, I cannot love thee so. End of Something Natural This recording is in the public domain. A Feeling by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Soleri the flowers in the grass to me are eloquent reproachfully. For would they wave so pleasantly or look so fresh and fair, if a man cunning, hollow, mean, or one in any wise unclean were looking on them there? No, he hath grown so foolish wise, he cannot see with childhood's eyes. He hath forgot that purity and lowliness which are the key of nature's mysteries. No, 
He hath wandered off so long from his own place of birth, that he hath lost his mother tongue, and like one come from far off lands, forgetting and forgot, he stands beside his mother's hearth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lost Child by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Soleri Part 1 I wandered down the sunny glade and ever mused my love of thee. My thoughts like little children played as gaily and as guilelessly. Part 2 If any chanced to go astray, moaning in fear of coming harms, hope brought the wanderer back alway, safe nestled in her snowy arms. Part 3 From that soft nest the happy one looked up at me and calmly smiled. Its hair shone golden in the sun and made it seem a heavenly child. Part 4 Dear Hope's blue eyes smiled mildly down and blessed it with a love so deep that like a nursling of her own, it clasped her neck and fell asleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Church by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson I love the rites of England's church, I love to hear and see the priest and people reading slow the solemn litany. I love to hear the glorious swell of chanted psalm and prayer, and the deep organ's bursting heart throb through the shivering air. Chants that a thousand years have heard, I love to hear again, for visions of the olden time are wakened by the strain. With gorgeous hues the window glass seems suddenly to glow, and rich and red the streams of light down through the chancel flow. And then I murmur, Surely God delighteth here to dwell. This is the temple of his Son, whom he doth love so well. But when I hear the creed which saith, This church alone is his, I feel within my soul that he hath purer shrines than this. For his is not the builded church, nor organ-shaken dome. In everything that lovely is, he loves and hath his home. And most in soul that loveth well all things which he hath made, knowing no creed but simple faith that may not be gainsaid. His church is universal love, and whoso dwells therein shall need no custom sacrifice to wash away his sin and music in its aisles shall swell of lives upright and true, sweet as dreamed sounds of angel harps down quivering through the blue. They shall not ask a litany, the souls that worship there, but every look shall be a hymn, and every word a prayer. Their service shall be written bright in calm and holy eyes, and every day from fragrant hearts fit incense shall arise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Unlovely by James Russell Lowell, sung for LibriVox.org by Iswa in Belgium in June 2015. The pretty things that others wear Look strange and out of place on me I never seem dressed tastefully Because I am not fair And when I would most pleasing seem And deck myself with joyful care I find it is an idle dream Because I am not fair if I put roses in my hair, they bloom as if in mockery. Nature denies her sympathy, because I am not fair. 
alas i have a warm true heart but when i show it people stare i must forever dwell apart because i am not fair i am least happy being where the hearts of others are most light and strive to keep me out of sight because i am not fair the glad ones often give a glance as i am sitting lonely there that asks me why i do not dance because i am not fair and if to smile on them i dare for that my heart with love runs o'er they say what is she laughing for because i am not fair love's condom is interpreted it is the hardest thing to bear i often wish that i were dead because i am not fair in joy or grief i must not share for neither smiles nor tears on me will ever look becomingly because i am not fair all days i sit alone and cry and in my grave i wish i were yet none will weep me if i die because i am not fair my grave will be so lone and bare i fear to think of those dark hours for none will plant it oh with flowers because i am not fair they will not in the summer come and speak kind words above me there to me the grave will be no home because i am not fair End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love Song by James Russell Lowell Sung for LibriVox.org by Iswa in Belgium in June 2015 Nearer to thy mother heart Simple nature press me let me know thee as thou art fill my soul and bless me i have loved thee long and well i have loved thee heartily shall i never with thee dwell never be at one with thee inward inward to thy heart kindly nature take me lovely even as thou art full of loving make me thou knowest not of dead cold forms knowest not of littleness life full truth thy being warms majesty and earnestness homeward homeward to thy heart dearest nature call me let no halfness no mean part any longer thrall me i will be thy lover true i will be a faithful soul then circle me then look me through fill me with a mighty whole end of poem this recording is in the public domain song by james russell lowell sung for LibriVox.org by iswa in belgium in june 2015 all things are sad i go and ask of memory that she tells sweet tales to me to make me glad and she takes me by the hand 
leadeth to old places showeth the old faces in her hazy mirage land oh her voice is sweet and low and her eyes are fresh to mine as the dew gleaming through the half unfolded eglantine long ago long ago but i feel that i am only yet more sad and yet more lonely then i turn to blue-eyed hope and beg of her that she will ope her golden gates for me she is fair and full of grace but she has the form and face of her mother memory clear as air her glad voice ringeth joyous are the songs she singeth yet i hear them mournfully they are songs her mother taught her crooning to her infant daughter as she lay upon her knee many little ones she bore me woe is me in bygone hours who danced along and sang before me scattering my way with flowers one by one they are gone and their silent graves are seen shining fresh with mosses green where the rising sun beams slope o'er the dewy land of hope but when sweet memory faileth and hope looks strange and cold when youth no more availeth and grief grows overbold when softest winds are dreary and summer sunlight weary and sweetest things uncheery we know not why when the crown of our desires weighs upon the brow and tires and we would die die for our we know not what something we seem to have forgot something we had and now have not when the present is away and the future seems our foe and with shrinking eyes we wait as one who dreads a sudden blow in the dark he knows not whence when love at last his bright eye closes and the bloom upon his face that lends him such a living grace is a shadow from the roses wherewith we have decked his beer because he once was passing dear when we feel the laden sense 
sense of nothingness and impotence till we grow mad then the body saith there's but one true faith all things are said end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Love Dream by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Iswa, in Belgium, in July 2015. Pleasant thoughts come wandering when thou art far from thee to me. On their silver wings they bring a very peaceful ecstasy, a feeling of eternal spring, so that winter half forgets everything but that thou art, and in his bewildered heart dreameth of the violets, or those bluer flowers that ope, flowers of steadfast love and hope watered by the living wells of memories dear and dearer prophecies when young spring forever dwells in the sunshine of thine eyes i have most holy dreams of thee all night i have such dreams and when i awake reality no whit the darker seems through the twin gates of hope and memory they pour in crystal streams from out an angel's calmed eyes who from twilight till sunrise far away in the upper deep Poised upon his shining wings, over us his watch doth keep, and, as he watcheth, ever sings. Through the still night I hear him sing down looking on our sleep. I hear his clear, clear harp strings ring, and, as the golden notes take wing, gently downward hovering, for very joy I weep. He singeth songs of holy love, that quiver through the depths afar, where the blessed spirits are, and lingeringly from above shower till the morning star his silver shield hath buckled on, and sentinels the dawn alone, quivering his gleamy spear through the dusky atmosphere. Almost, my love, I fear the morn, when that blessed voice shall cease, lest it should leave me quite forlorn, stripped of my snowy robe of peace. And yet the bright reality is fairer than all dreams can be, for through my spirit all day long ring echoes of that angel song in melodious thoughts of thee. And well, I know it cannot die till eternal morn shall break, for through life's slumber thou and I will keep it for each other's sake, and it shall not be silent when we wake. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fourth of July Ode by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Scott Bennett 1. Our fathers fought for liberty. They struggled long and well. History of their deeds can tell. But did they leave us free? 2. Are we free from vanity? Free from pride and free from self? Free from love of power and pelf, from everything that's beggarly? 3. Are we free from stubborn will, from low hate and malice small, from opinion's tyrant thrall? Are none of us our own slaves still? 4. Are we free to speak our thought, to be happy and be poor? free to enter heaven's door, to live and labor as we ought. 5. Are we then made free at last from the fear of what men say, free to reverence today, free from the slavery of the past? 6. Our fathers fought for liberty. They struggled long and well, History of their deeds can tell, but ourselves must set us free. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sphinx by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Vita. 1. Why mourn we for the golden prime? When our young souls were kingly, 
strong and true the soul is greater than all time it changes not but yet is ever new two but that the soul is noble we could never know what nobleness had been be what ye dream and earth shall see a greater greatness than she e'er hath seen three the flower pines not to be fair it never asketh to be sweet and dear but gives itself to sun and air and so is fresh and full from year to year for nothing in nature weeps its lot nothing save man abides in memory forgetful that the past is what ourselves may choose the coming time to be five all things are circular the past was given to us to make the future great and the void future shall at last be the strong brother of an after fate six we sit beside the sphinx of life we gaze into its void unanswering eyes and spend ourselves in idle strife to read the riddle of their mysteries seven arise be earnest and be strong the sphinx's eyes shall suddenly grow clear and speak as plain to thee ere long as the dear maiden who holds thee most dear eight the meaning of all things in us yea in the lives we give our souls doth lie make then their meaning glorious by such a life as need not fear to die nine there is no heartbeat in the day which bears a record of the smallest deed but holds within its faith alway that which in doubt we vainly strive to read ten one seed contains another seed and that a third and so forevermore and promise of as great a deed lies folded in the deed that went before eleven so ask not fitting space or time yet could not dream of things that could not be each day shall make the next sublime and time be swallowed in eternity twelve god bless the present it is all it has been future and it shall be past awake and live thy strength recall and in one trinity unite them fast thirteen action and life lo hear the key of all on earth that seemeth dark and wrong win this and with it freely ye may enter that bright realm for which ye long fourteen then all these bitter questionings shall with a full and blessed answer meet past worlds whereof the poet sings shall be the earth beneath his snow-white fleet end of poem this recording is in the public domain go little book by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by hee kitty Go, little book, the world is wide. There's room and verge enough for thee, for thou hast learned that only pride lacketh fit opportunity, which comes unbid to modesty. Go, win thy way with gentleness. I send thee forth, my firstborn child, quite, quite alone to face the stress of fickle skies and pathways wild, where few can keep them undefiled thou earnest from a poet's heart a warm still home and full of rest far from the pleasant eyes thou art of those who know and love thee best and by whose hearthstones thou wert blessed go knock thou softly at the door where any gentle spirits been tell them thy tender feet are sore wandering so far from all thy kin and ask if thou may enter in 
Back thou a cupful from the spring of charity, In Christ's dear name, few will deny so small a thing, Nor ask unkindly if thou came of one whose life might do thee shame. We all are prone to go astray, our hopes are bright, our lives are dim, but thou art pure, and if they say, We know thy father, and our whim he pleases not, plead thou for him. For many are, by whom all truth that speaks not in their mother tongue, is stoned to death with hands unruth, or hath its patient spirit wrung, cold words and colder looks among. Yet fear not, for skies are fair to all whose souls are fair within. Thou wilt find shelter everywhere with those to whom a different skin is not a damning proof of sin. But if all others are unkind, there's one heart whither thou canst fly for shelter from the biting wind. And in that home of purity, it were no bitter thing to die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 1 Disappointment by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty. I pray thee, call not this society. I ask for bread. Thou givest me a stone. I am unhungered, and I find not one to give me meat, to joy or grief with me. I find not here what I went out to see, souls of true men, of women who can move the deeper, better part of us to love, souls that can hold with mine communion free. Alas, must then these hopes, these longings high, this yearning of the soul for brotherhood and all that makes us pure and wise and good come broken-hearted home again to die? No, hope is left and prays with bended head. Give us this day, O God, our daily bread. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet Two, by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty. Great human nature, whither art thou fled? Are these things creeping forth and back again? These hollow formalists and echoes, men? Art thou entombed with the mighty dead? In God's name, no. Not yet hath all been said, or done, or longed for, that is truly great. These pitiful dried crusts will never sate, Nature's for which pure truth is daily bread. We were not meant to plod along this earth, Strange to ourselves, and to our fellows strange. We were not meant to struggle from our birth, To skulk and creep, and in mean pathways range. Act with stern truth, large faith, and loving will. Up and be doing, God is with us still. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 3 To a Friend by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty. One strip of bark may feed the broken tree, Giving to some few limbs a sickly green, And one light shower on the hills I ween May keep the spring from drying utterly. Thus seemeth it with these our hearts to be. Hope is the strip of bark, the shower of rain, and so they are not wholly crushed with pain, but live and linger on, far sadder sight to see. Much do they err 
who tell us that the heart may not be broken. What, then, can we call a broken heart, if this may not be so, this death in life, when, shrouded in its pall, shunning and shunned, it dwelleth all apart, its power, its love, its sympathy laid low. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet four by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Hihikiti. So may it be, but let it not be so. Oh, let it not be so with thee, my friend. Be of good courage, bear up to the end and on thine after-way rejoicing go. We all must suffer if we aught would know. Life is a teacher stern, and wisdom's crown is oft a crown of thorns. Whence trickling down, blood mixed with tears, blinding her eyes doth flow. But time, a gentle nurse, shall wipe away this bloody sweat, and thou shalt find on earth that woman is not all in all to love. But living by a new and second birth, thy soul shall see all things below, above, grow bright and brighter to the perfect day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 5 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty. O child of nature, O most meek and free, Most gentle spirit of true nobleness, Thou doest not a worthy deed the less, Because the world may not its greatness see. What were a thousand triumphings to thee, Who in thyself art as a perfect sphere, Wrapped in a bright and natural atmosphere, of mighty solidness and majesty. Thy soul is not too high for lowly things, feels not its strength, seeing its brother weak, not for itself unto itself is dear, but for that it may guide the wanderings of fellow men, and to their spirits speak the lofty faith of heart that knows no fear. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 6 To Blank by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty Deem it no sodom fruit of vanity, Or fickle fantasy of unripe youth, which ever takes the fairest shows for truth, that I should wish my verse beloved of thee, tis love's deep thirst which may not quench it be. There is a gulf of longing and unrest, a wild love craving not to be repressed, whereto in all our hearts as to the sea the streams of feeling do forever flow. Therefore it is that thy well-meted praise falleth so shower-like and fresh on me, filling those springs which else had sunk full low, lost in the dreary desert sense of woe, or parched by passion's fierce and withering blaze. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 7 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty Might I but be beloved, and, O oh, most fair and perfect ordered soul, beloved of thee, how should I feel a cloud of earthly care, if thy blue eyes were ever clear to me? O oh, woman's love, O oh, flower most bright and rare, that blossoms brightest in extremest need, Woe, woe is me, that thy so precious seed is ever sown by fancy's changeful air, and grows sometimes in poor and barren hearts, 
who can be little even in the light of thy meek holiness, while souls more great are left to wander in a starless night, praying unheard. And yet the hardest parts befit those best who best can cope with fate. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 8 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty Sonnet 8 Why should we ever weary of this life? Our souls should widen ever, not contract, Go stronger and not harder in the strife, Filling each moment with a noble act, if we live thus of vigor all compact doing our duty to our fellow men and striving rather to exalt our race than our poor selves with earnest hand or pen we shall erect our names a dwelling-place which not all ages shall cast down again offspring of time shall then be born each hour which as of old earth lovingly shall guard to live forever in youth perfect flower and guide her future children heavenward end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet nine green mountains by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org, by Rhymesmith. Ye mountains, that far off lift up your heads, seen dimly through their canopies of blue, the shade of my unrestful spirit sheds distance-created beauty over you. I am not well content with this far view. How may I know what foot of loved one treads your rocks, moss-grown, and sun-dried torrent-beds? We should love all things better if we knew what claims the meanest have upon our hearts. Perchance, even now, some eye that would be bright to meet my own looks on your mist-robed forms. Perchance your grandeur a deep joy imparts to souls that have encircled mine with light. O oh, brother heart! With thee my spirit warms. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet ten by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhymesmith. My friend, a down life's valley hand in hand, with grateful change of grave and merry speech or song, our hearts unlocking each to each, we'll journey onward to the silent land, and when stern death shall loose that loving band, taking in his cold hand a hand of ours, the one shall strew the other's grave with flowers, nor shall his heart a moment be unmanned. My friend and brother, if thou goest first, wilt thou no more revisit me below? Yea, when my heart seems happy, causelessly, and swells, not dreaming why, as it would burst with joy unspeakable, my soul shall know that thou, unseen, art bending over me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet eleven by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Rhymesmith. Verse cannot say how beautiful thou art, how glorious the calmness of thine eyes, full of unconquerable energies, telling that thou hast acted well thy part. No doubt or fear thy steady faith can start, no thought of evil dare come nigh to thee, who hast the courage meek of purity. The self-stayed greatness of a loving heart, strong with serene, enduring fortitude. Where'er thou art, that seems thy fitting place. 
for not of forms but nature art thou child and lowest things put on a noble grace when touched by ye o patient ruth-like mild and spotless hands of earnest womanhood in the poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet 12 by james russell lowell read for librivox.org by rhymesmith the soul would fain its loving kindness tell but custom hangs like lead upon the tongue the heart is brimful hollow crowds among when it finds one whose life and thought are well up to the eyes its gushing love doth swell the angel cometh and the waters move yet it is fearful still to say i love and words come grating as a jangled bell oh might we only speak but what we feel might the tongue pay but what the heart doth owe not heaven's great thunder when deep peal on peal it shakes the earth could rouse our spirits so or to the soul such majesty reveal as two short words half spoken faint and low end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet 13 by james russell lowell read for librivox.org by sky albatross i saw a gate a harsh voice spake and said this is the gate of life above was writ leave hope behind all ye who enter it then shrank my heart within itself for dread but softer than the summer rain is shed words dropped upon my soul and they did say fear nothing fate shall save thee watch and pray so without fear i lifted up my head and lo that writing was not one fair word was carven in its steed and it was love then rained once more those sweet tones from above with healing on their wings i humbly heard i am the life ask and it shall be given i am the way by me ye enter heaven end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet fourteen by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by sky albatross to the dark narrow house where loved ones go whence no steps outward turn whose silent door none but the sexton knocks at any more are they not sometimes with us yet below the longings of the soul would tell us so although so pure and fine their being's essence our bodily eyes are witless of their presence yet not within the tomb their spirits glow like wizard lamps pent up but whensoever with great thoughts worthy of their high behests our souls are filled those bright ones with us be as in the patriarch's tent his angel guests oh let us live so worthily that never we may be far from that blessed company. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 15 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Sky Albatross I fain would give to thee the loveliest things, For lovely things belong to thee of right and thou hast been as peaceful to my sight as the still thoughts that summer twilight brings beneath the shadow of thine angel wings oh let me live oh let me rest in thee growing to thee more and more utterly upbearing and upborn till outward things are only as they share in thee a part look kindly on me let thy holy eyes bless me from the deep fullness of thy heart so shall my soul in its right strength arise 
and nevermore shall pine and shrink and start, safe sheltered in thy full soul sympathies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet sixteen by James Russell Lowell read for LibriVox.org by Sky Albatross Much I had mused of love, and in my soul there was one chamber where I dared not look, so much its dark and dreary voidness shook my spirit, feeling that I was not whole. All my deep longings flowed toward one goal for long long years but were not answered till hope was drooping fate well nigh stone dead and i was still a blind earth delving mole yet did i know that god was wise and good and would fulfil my being later soon nor was such taught in vain for seeing thee great love rose up as over a black pine wood round bright and clear up started the full moon filling my soul with glory utterly end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet seventeen by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by sky albatross sayest thou most beautiful that thou wilt wear flowers and leafy crowns when thou art old and that thy heart shall never grow so cold but they shall love to read thy silvered hair and into ages snows the hope of springtide bear oh in thy childlike wisdom's moveless hold dwell ever still the blessings manifold of purity of peace and untaught care for others hearts around thy pathway shed and thou shalt have a crown of deathless flowers to glorify and guard thy blessed head and give their freshness to thy life's last hours and when the bridge groom call it they shall be a wedding garment white as snow for thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet eighteen by james russell lowell read for librivox dot org by sky albatross poet who sittest in thy pleasant room warming thy heart with idle thoughts of love and of a holy life that leads above striving to keep life's spring flowers still in bloom and lingering to snuff their fresh perfume oh there were other duties meant for thee than to sit down in peacefulness and be oh there are brother hearts that dwell in gloom souls loathsome foul and black with daily sin so crusted over with baseness that no ray of heaven's blessed light may enter in come down then to the hot and dusty way and lead them back to hope and peace again for save an act thy love is all in vain end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet nineteen no more but so by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org By Emily Sullivan No more, but so? No more, but so? Only with uncold looks, And with a hand not laggard to clasp mine, Thinkest thou to pay what debt of love is thine? No more, but so? Like gushing water brooks, freshening and making green the dimmest nooks of thy friend's soul, thy kindliness should flow. But if tis bound by not saying no, I can find more of friendship in my books, all lifeless though they may be, and more, far more, in every simplest moss or flower or tree. 
open to me, thy heart of hearts, deep core, or never say that I am dear to thee. Call me not friend, if thy keep close the door that leads to thine inmost sympathy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Voice Heard in Mount Auburn by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Domenica Campbell Like the low warblings of a leaf-hid bird, thy voice came to me through the screening trees, singing the simplest, long-known melodies. I had no glimpse of thee, and yet I heard and blessed thee for each clearly carolled word. I longed to thank thee, and my heart would frame, Mary or Ruth, some sisterly sweet name for thee. Yet could I not my lips have stirred, I knew that thou wert lovely, that thine eyes were blue and downcast, and methought large tears unknown to thee, up to their lids must rise with half-sad memories of other years. As to thyself alone thou sangest, or that to childhood seemed to say, no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 21 on reading Spencer again by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Rhymesmith Dear gentle Spencer, thou my soul dost lead, a little child again, through fairyland, by many a bower and stream of golden sand, and many a sunny plain, whose light doth breed a sunshine in my happy heart, and feed my fancy with sweet visions. I become a knight, and with my charmed arms would roam to seek for fame and many a wondrous deed of high emprise. For I have seen the light of Una's angel's face, the golden hair and backward eyes of startled Florimel, and, for their holy sake, I would outdare a host of cruel pain-ends in the fight, or archimage and all the powers of hell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 22 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox by Siobhan Rodinger Light of mine eyes, with thy so trusting look And thy sweet smile of charity and love That from a treasure well uplaid above And from a hope in Christ its blessing took Light of my heart, which when it could not brook the coldness of another's sympathy finds ever a deep peace and stay in thee, warm as the sunshine of a mossy nook, light of my soul, who by thy saintless and faith that acts itself in daily life, canst raise me above weakness and canst bless the hardest thraldom of my earthly strife, I dare not say how much thou art to me, even to myself, and oh, far less to thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 23 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Siobhan Rodinger Silent as one who treads on new-fallen snow, Love came upon me ere I was aware. Not light of heart, for there was troublous care Upon his eyelids, drooping them full low, As with sad memory of a healed woe. The cold rain shivered in his golden hair, As if an outcast lot had been his share, And he seemed doubtful whither he should go. 
Then he fell on my neck, and in my breast, hiding his face, a while sobbed bitterly, as half in grief to be so long distressed, and half in joy at his security. At last, uplooking from his place of rest, his eyes shone blessedness and hope on me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 24 by James Russell Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Vita. A gentleness that grows of steady faith, a joy that sheds its sunshine everywhere, a humble strength and readiness to bear those burdens which strict duty ever layeth upon our souls, which unto sorrow saith, Here is no soil for thee to strike thy roots, here only grow those sweet and precious fruits, which ripen for the soul that well obeyeth, a patience which the world can neither give nor take away, a courage strong and high that dares in simple usefulness to live, and without one sad look behind to die. When that day comes, these tell me that our love is building for itself a home above. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 25 by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Vida When the glad soul is full to overflow, Unto the tongue all power it denies, And only trusts its secret to the eyes, For by an inborn wisdom it doth know There's no other eloquence but so, And when the tongue's weak utterance doth suffice, Prisoned within the body's cell it lies, Remembering in tears its exiled woe, That word which all mankind so long to hear, Which bears the spirit back to whence it came, Maketh this sullen clay as crystal clear, And will not be enclouded in a name. It is a truth which we can feel and see, But is as boundless as eternity. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 26 To the Evening Star by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty. When we have once said lowly, Evening Star, words give no more. For in thy silver pride thou shinest as naught else can shine beside. The thick smoke coiling round the sooty bar forever, And the customed lamplight mar the stillness of my thought. Seeing things glide so samely, Then I ope my windows wide, And gaze in peace to where thou shinest afar. The wind that comes across the faint white snow so freshly, and the river dimly seen, seem like new things that never had been so before. And thou art bright as thou hast been since thy white rays put sweetness in the eyes of the first souls that loved in paradise. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 27 Reading by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty As one who on some well-known landscape looks, be it alone or with some dear friend nigh, each day beholdeth fresh variety, new harmonies of hills and trees and brooks, so is it with the worthiest choice of books, and oftenest read, if thou no meaning spy, deem there is meaning wanting in thy eyes. 
We are so lured from judgment by the crooks and winding ways of covert fantasy or turned unwittingly down beaten tracks of our foregone conclusions that we see in our own want the writer's misdeemed lacks. It is with true books as with nature each new day of living doth new insight teach. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 28 To Blank After a Snowstorm by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Hihi Kitty Blue as thine eyes, the river gently flows between his banks, which, far as I can see, are whiter than aught else on earth may be, save inmost thoughts that in thy soul repose. The trees, all crystalled by the melted snows, sparkle with gems and silver, such as we in childhood saw, mong groves of fairy, and the dear skies are sunny blue as those. Still as thy heart, when next mine own it lies in love's full safety, is the bracing air. The earth is all enwrapped with draperies, snow-white, as that pure love might choose to wear. Oh, for one moment's look into thine eyes, to share the joy such scene would kindle there. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Edith by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk A lily with its frail cup filled with dew Down bending, modestly, snow-white and pale Shedding faint fragrance round its native veil Minds me of thee, sweet Edith, mild and true, And of thy eyes, so innocent and blue. Thy heart is fearful as a startled hare, Yet hath in it a fortitude to bear, For love's sake, and a gentle faith which grew of love. Need of a stay whereon to lean, Felt in thyself, hath taught thee to uphold and comfort others, and to give, unseen, the kindness thy still love cannot withhold. Maiden, I would my sister thou hadst been, that round thee I, my guarding arms, might fold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rose by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk My ever-lightsome, ever-laughing rose Who always speakest first and thinkest last Thy full voice is as clear as bugle-blast Right from the ear down to the heart it goes And says, I'm beautiful as who but knows thy name reminds me of old romping days of kisses stolen in dark passageways or in the parlor if the mother knows gave sign of drowsy watch i wonder where are gone thy tokens given with a glance so full of everlasting love till morrow or a day's endless grieving for the dance last night denied, Backed with a lock of hair That spake of broken hearts And deadly sorrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mary by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Dark hair, dark eyes, not too dark to be deep, And full of feeling, 
yet enough to glow with fire when angered feelings never slow but which seem rather watching to forth leap from her full breast a gently flowing sweep of words in common talk a torrent rush whenever through her soul swift feelings gush a heart less ready to be gay than weep yet cheerful ever a calm matron smile that bids god bless you a chaste simpleness with somewhat too of proper pride in dress this portrait to my mind's eye came the while i thought of thee the well-grown woman mary whilom a gold-haired laughing little fairy End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Caroline by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. A staidness sobers o'er her pretty face, which something but ill hidden in her eyes, and a quaint look about her lips denies a lingering love of girlhood you can trace in her checked laugh and half restrained pace and when she bears herself most womanly it seems as if a watchful mother's eye kept down with sobering glance her childish grace yet oftentimes her nature gushes free as water long held back by little hands within a pump and let forth suddenly until her task remembering she stands a moment silent smiling doubtfully then laughs aloud and scorns her hated bands end of poem this recording is in the public domain Anne by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. There is a pensiveness in quiet Anne, a mournful drooping of the full gray eye, as if she had shook hands with misery and known some care since her short life began. Her cheek is seriously pale, nigh wan and though of cheerfulness there is no lack you feel as if she must be dressed in black yet is she not of those who all they can strive to be gay and striving seem most sad hers is not grief but silent soberness you would be startled if you saw her glad and startled if you saw her weep no less she walks through life as on the sabbath day she decorously glides to church to pray end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of early poems by james russell lowell